Hello friends. This is Fanfic Universe. How are you all? So in this video, we will see. What if Naruto had the power of Wolf Goddess? But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time, let's begin the story. It was early July in the ninja village known as Konoha, the hidden village of the leaf. This village was known for being hidden in a forest of trees, despite the fact there was a road leading right to it. Conceded much, it's strong shinobi that despite popular belief were rather weak individually and their only saving grace was their teamwork that the village boasted about that made them appear strong, and also the kindness of its people, yeah, right. It produced great shinobi, such as the Senju brothers, Hashirama and Tobarama, who were the Shodaim and Nadaim Hokage respectively, Hiruzen Serutobi, the Sandame Hokage and the Sensei of the Sanin, also known as the Professor. Then there was Minato Namikaze, the fourth and current Hokage, who was known as the Yellow Flash in Konoha, due to his use of the Nadaim's Hiroshin no Jutsu. And other ninja who while not being the cage, were in their own right famous, such as Kakashi Hitaki, Asuma Serutobi, etc. Konoha was considered number one, of the top five shinobi villages in the entire elemental countries, with Kumo coming in second, Iwa in third, Kiri though while in a state of bloodline purges, was fourth, and Suna fifth. It was almost completely destroyed when on October 10th, the Kayubi attacked the village after it was ripped from its host, Kashina Uzumaki, formerly of Uzushiogakur, after the village's destruction, who was giving birth. The fox went on a rampage while under the influence of a masked man, we know who he is, who somehow found the secret location where Kashina was giving birth, thank a past obsessed Kakashi, killed the Anbu security detail, breached an S-rank barrier jutsu, and killed the midwives, Awako Serutobi and Taji before taking Naruto the older of the twins hostage. Minato Namikaze, after saving his wife and both children, battled the masked man who proclaimed himself, Madara Uchiha and wounded him after relinquishing him control of the Kayubi, forcing the intruder to retreat. Afterwards, with the fox still running amok still slightly under the influence of a Sharingan Genjutsu, and pissed off that it was being attacked, Minato had to face the most difficult and heart-wrenching decision of his life, resealing the nine tails into one of his twin children, after all you want to preserve the balance of power. Jerk. After a minute of thinking, and with time running out, he decided to seal the Kayubi's young half into his daughter, Natsumi, whom he thought, might inherit his wife's special chakra. However large quantities of the Kayubi's chakra were still ravaging the village. Knowing he couldn't risk opening Natsumi's seal, with the possibility of the fox breaking out, he under the light of a rising sun and setting moon sealed the most of the excess chakra into his son, Naruto. Though unknown to him he messed up a hand sign slightly, making what he, and those who knew for years of that event presumed to be a pseudo Jinchuriki, and died while sealing the yin half of the Kayubi into himself. Somehow, by some miracle, Kashina survived the ordeal, happy to be with her children, though she left a pissed off specter of the Shinigami that was now missing a hand, who disappeared but not before telling her something that she left unheeded. Of course, she now had to face the ultimate question from the villagers. Elders, and village council that Tobarama set up during his reign as Hokage to lighten the load of paperwork he got, however while the idea looked good on paper it backfired tremendously as successive civilian council members gained more control of the village till the title Hokage in Konoha was only a glorified paper pusher position by Minato's short tenure, that he had planned to address his concerns for, if he had lived. Who was the container of the Kayubi? At first she planned to tell them the truth, though if she was smarter she would have said Minato sealed inside himself which was partly true, but knowing of how much death and destruction was caused by the Kayubi's rampage, she knew the villagers and the elders would do everything in their power to make the new Jinchuriki miserable. Then there was the thought of her little girl being tortured and raped. So with a heavy heart, and knowing that her son will live a solitary life, without many friends, she announced that her eldest Naruto was the Jinchuriki. The reactions were what she feared, as the village elders and civilian council, with the exception of the shinobi council, sans the Uchiha head Fugaku, called for the young boy's death or turned into a weapon. It was here that Konoha's reputation in the eyes of Kahina Namikaze ne Uzumaki, was shattered. 
Hirazen Serutobi who was reinstated as the Hokage immediately shot down both attempts and decreed that the older generation were forbidden to tell the younger of Naruto's status as a Jinchuriki. Of course, this didn't stop them from attempting to harm the young child. The Uzumaki, Namikaze family lived happily together for three years, until Kashina eventually, decided to train Natsumi in controlling the Kyuubi's chakra. For some reason, she never offered Naruto the same training, and denied his requests every time. At first the neglect wasn't so serious, but as time went on it became worse, and worse. Then Naruto's mother and sister distanced themselves even more from their nearly forgotten family member. That is where we come to today, as Kashina was training her daughter. Natsumi Uzumaki Namikaze was a seven-year-old girl who had shoulder-length blonde hair that was the same color like her father's was, with the exception that it had crimson highlights in it, cerulean blue eyes that any boy could get lost in, a beauty mark under her right eye, and a face like her mother with the exception that it was narrower and she had slightly higher cheekbones giving her an aristocratic look and had three whisker marks on each cheek. And was wearing a burnt orange and black track jacket over a mesh shirt and a burnt orange knee length skirt with black edging that had a slit on the right going halfway up so that it wouldn't hinder her movement and black sandals. Currently she was focusing chakra into her hand, which began to spin until it formed a rotating ball. Yes, I did it, I finally did it, she shouted in jubilation, happy that she accomplished one of her father's signature jutsu, the Rasengan. Kashina smiled at her daughter, very proud of her. Nice work, Natsumi-chan, said Kashina, keep this up and you'll be able to become a great kunoichi like me, in no time. Natsumi smiled as her mother who was wearing a high-collared, sleeveless white blouse under a long, loose-fitting dress with a wristband on her left wrist and standard shinobi sandals walked up and gave her a hug, and on the cheek. Watching this from the top of a tree, was Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze, a few minutes older than his sister, who had spiky hair like Minato had, only a bit tamer, and that it was a silver starlight shade in color, kind of like Sophie Hatter's hair color in Howl's Moving Castle at the end of the movie, with white highlights in it and red tips. His eyes were the same shape and rich purple as his mother, but the rest of his face was a mixture between his father and the Nidimes, and strangely enough he had slightly tapered ears, and although he shouldn't have, but did, he had rich golden tan skin, even though he hardly went out of the house much and he was currently wearing a mesh shirt under an unzipped burgundy sweatshirt, as well as black jeans that were ripped in a few places and slightly worn out, and black sneakers. He also had like his sister three whisker marks on each cheek, but instead of being thick like hers were, his were thin. In addition to the whisker marks he had three vertical scars underneath his left eye that he was born with, and extended to his left ear. The young boy looked at the scene with an indifferent expression on his face, but if anyone looked at his eyes they would see disappointment and envy, a small part of himself wished he was part of the family moment. But alas, he wasn't, due to his mother severely neglecting him while favoring his younger sister, who was, unknown still to the whole village the real Jinchuriki of the Kayubi. He had asked his mother many times if she could train him since he believed he had some of the fox's chakra, but was turned away every time. The last and final time, didn't end well, as while doing a basic chakra control exercise, tree walking. His mother caught him and yelled at him, calling him many hurtful words that no child deserves from a parent. After being scolded he was sent to his room, and entering it, coincidentally it was also the smallest of the bedrooms in the house, he curled up in a corner and cried his eyes out, not noticing that they flashed a dull green for a second. Asking, praying to Kami why everything was unfair to him, it was also at that point where he lost most of his love for his mother and sibling. His misery sad to say didn't end at home though. Whenever he would leave the house, the civilians and most shinobi would either glare, insult, spit on him, no it was not the Greek tradition of spitting at newlyweds, I'll tell you that, or on many occasions gang up on him and beat him. He was also stabbed, poisoned, locked out of the house and nearly starved, mauled by various animals, was once chained to an iron pole in a thunderstorm and became a human lightning rod, and literally drowned and pronounced dead once for a minute as well though every time the civilians and few random shinobi were done with him, he would heal until there wasn't a single scar showing. This happened because his mother and the Sandame, though the both of them hated themselves for it, officially announced Naruto, as the Jinchuriki of the Kayubi, she the council, he the rest of the village. Naruto inwardly sighed at that, he might not be the container of the fox, but one thing was certain, he did contain something that had certain properties of a biju. 
You see what Kashina, or anyone in Konoha didn't count on, or notice was that the excess chakra of the Kayubi, the Shinigami's right hand and little bit of godly Kai that was inside it, as well as some solar energy from the rising sun that was ed into Naruto's seal as well actually combined together and formed into a new entity. This entity, based on Naruto's feelings of wanting love and attention, as well as his sadness, hate, and cold judgment from the Shinigami, became Naruto's first and one of the only few friends he had. Naruto's lips twisted a little upwards, as he remembered how he met her. It was after the severe scolding he got from his mother, that while crying in the corner of his room, he passed out and went into his mindscape. Flashback one and a half years ago Naruto's mindscape Naruto woke up to find himself in what looked like a cedar forest where the trees looked as tall as forty-story tall buildings. But couldn't tell how light it was because the sky that he could barely see through the tree branches, that were way too far up to reach, was covered in dark clouds that were raining, if he could see the sky, he would notice it would be twilight out, Naruto, stunned, pinched himself to see if he was dreaming and became shocked when he felt it. What is this place? He thought to himself as he looked around, trying to see if he could find anyone else here. As he walked through the forest, he could hear the sounds of various birds singing if that was possible, as well as some type of music that sounded like a chorus of men singing or humming if he listened closely, Zelda Ocarina of Time, Temple of Time, and felt calmed by the sound. And if he noticed, he would have see the rain begin to lessen. But then, a new, and heartbreaking whimpering sound got his attention. Childlike curiosity, or something like it getting the better of him, Naruto followed the sound, and soon came upon a clearing with the ruins of a temple inside, that had a small lake by it, with two statues that looked to guarding an entrance way. Walking through he saw a flat pedestal in the middle of what used to be a room but was now overrun with bushes and trees, and on the pedestal he saw what looked like a white and black thing curled up into a ball. He then heard the whimpering sound again, this time coming from the ball and carefully moved toward it. As soon as he reached the whimpering ball he bent down and reached his hand towards it. Just as his fingertips touched it, the ball jumped, revealing the ball to a bipedal wolf, which was actually a wolf hybrid anthro, Chibaya Kutatushia from DSNG Sci-Fi Megaverse is the model for the girl, girl almost as tall as himself with long white hair, and really short white fur, where he could see her body not covered by a black cloak that gave her the appearance of having white skin. Sky blue eyes, and silver slitted pupils a violent crescent mark on the center of her forehead, and although he couldn't see them due to them being underneath the cloak, three pairs of folded wings on her back that if he saw them Naruto would have noticed every feather was edged in violet and a bushy tail that had a violet stripe on it. But what shocked him is what it did next. Ah. W who are you? The wolf girl said, causing Naruto to blink multiple times before. Ah. The silverette yelled as he jumped in the air and landed on his bottom. Why you just talked? He hysterically said after getting over his shock as he pointed to the girl. Who gave him a slight glare. Of course I can talk. Got a problem with it. Naruto didn't know how to answer that, as he kept looking at the wolf girl. What are you? He finally asked the wolf girl after a period of silence, and why were you crying? The girl's eyes seemed to glisten with tears, and her wolf ears wilted a little at that, because I'm all alone, she said, no one is here except me. Naruto's heart ached as he slowly approached the girl again. How long have you been here? He asked. Since after the day your father sealed the excess chakra from the fur into you, she said, causing the eyes of the silverette to widen in shock. How much do you know about the Kayubi? He asked, and the girl sniffed a bit. The chakra your father sealed into you also had the fox's memories, the girl explained. When it and its siblings were created by the Rakuto Senen from the Jubi, to the day it attacked your village. When your father sealed the fox's chakra, he didn't know that he slightly messed up a hand sign and that the seal gathered some of your chakra, the chakra of a wolf that happened to be passing through, the Shinigami's right hand along with the energy in it as well as some of its memories pertaining to this world, and some lunar and solar energy from the sun and moon while they were rising and setting. Thus I was conceived, though the moon also had chakra for some reason in it, which the seal also took a little bit of. Naruto's eyes nearly popped out at that, are you saying why? You're some sort of god, he nearly shouted. Kinda, it's complicated, the girl said, and when I was born, I found myself here. Alone, without the love of a parent, warmth of a companion or anything. Naruto looked at the wolf girl with sympathy as she started crying again. 
he could somewhat relate to the girl, since she reminded him of himself. Do you have a name? he asked, and the girl shook her head. No, since no one was here to give me one. Naruto then did something that surprised the wolf girl. The starlight-haired boy walked over to the wolf girl and gave her a hug. I know how it feels, being alone, he said as he stroked her hair. How would you know? The girl said while starting to get defensive, you have your mother and sister. Naruto's eyes then gained a pained look at that moment. My family doesn't see me that way anymore, he said, surprising the wolf girl yet again. They both agreed that I'm not worth their time, and so they excluded me as their family. Sounds like you really don't like them, the girl said. The silverette shook his head as if to say no at that. I don't hate them. In fact, I I I, at that moment something seemed to snap within Naruto, as memories of the past came flooding through his mind, he came to a realization, and the light of innocence in his eyes dimmed a little as if he permanently lost something precious to him, like someone losing an arm or leg, I don't feel anything for them anymore, Naruto said in a sad but cold voice, I just wish they saw me as a son, brother at least once, and not have cast me aside. The girl didn't say a word, as she found comfort in the boy's embrace. Naruto looked at the girl, and could only smile as she unconsciously snuggled closer to his body, in his arms. You said you didn't have a name right? He asked and the wolf girl nodded, then how about I give you one? The girl perked up at that, why, you would really do that? She stammered, while Naruto gave her a wide grin, that made her feel warm inside herself. Of course, everyone needs a name, he said, and the girl could only gape in shock, but on the inside her heart was bursting with happiness, now what to call you? The silverette began to think of the names he knew in his mind, or read about, until one came up to him, causing him to smile. Thea. That sounds right, he said, and the girl looked at him blankly. Thea, the now-named wolf anthro girl said, to which Naruto looked down in thought. Yeah, it means goddess or divine. And just so you know, Thea was the titan goddess of sight and shining light of the clear blue sky which your eyes reminded me of. She was also the mother of the sun, moon and dawn. And the reason I came up with that name, was that you were conceived when the sun and moon were both in the sky, and the dawn was starting, thus it reminded me of her. Naruto said, you like it? The newly named Thea gave Naruto a look that he guessed was the wolf version of being shy, luckily for her, he didn't notice that she was madly blushing, I. I like it. Dot. Flashback end. Naruto opened his eyes after reliving that memory, and saw his family heading back inside as it was getting dark out. It had been a year and six months since that day. It made him happy to finally have a true bond with someone. Even if that someone was a young goddess, not going to lie, I'm sure there are a lot of males and some females who would do anything to be in Naruto's shoes at this point. Speaking of which, Thea had grown a little as they found out that she could absorb chakra, heat, or sunlight through the seal. She was now at two tails strength, and they had a theory that since she was part goddess, and that her power also partly came from nature, of which she could also absorb nature energy through the seal, then she would possibly reach ten tails or even more, possibly, by the time Naruto would reach fourteen years old. Naruto, also with the bond that the two shared, mastered the initial state where his irises would turn sky blue and his pupils turn slitted while becoming silver while his body was coated with an extremely fine layer of her chakra as well as what he dubbed the tail-less mode level 1, in which Naruto would then gain one set of wings made of chakra that looked like Thea's three sets, while being able to fly, and although there was a lot of effort involved to do so, let's just say it was a work in progress and leave it at that. And instead of her chakra being like the Kyubi's corrosive red and black, Thea's was a soothing blue, white, and violet. And instead of hurting like the Kyubi's did from what snippets he had heard from his mother and sister, Thea's chakra although a little painful was mostly pleasant. His thoughts were then interrupted, as Thea spoke though their telepathic link. Are you sure it was a good idea not to leave them a note, Naruto-kun? The young wolf goddess said. Two weeks ago, after another beating, they decided to find a place away from the village to train and get ready for the academy. Of course, there was the part where Naruto thought his mother would try to stop him for some reason, so he decided to do it the stealthy way. I'm sure Thea Chan, Naruto replied, if she notices that I'm gone, or where I'm going to be living for the next few years, the Sandame and she will send Anbu after me. Said girl gave a sigh at that and told him what had been on her mind for a while now, 
You know. You could have always told her about me Naruto-kun. Then she could have trained you along with your sister, she said. Naruto could only snort at that, it doesn't matter. Besides I doubt anyone would believe me, even if I did tell them, Thea Chan. Thea could only look at her container from inside him sadly at that. Things had deteriorated between Naruto and his family even more. As Naruto had stopped talking to the both of them, thinking he would be yelled at, or punished. He didn't make any suggestions of where they should go when they went out to eat, or where to shop, knowing his mother would always pick Natsumi's opinion over his. He decided it was best to stay quiet, and thus, when he trained, which at the time was only trying to do tree walking. Leaf sticking, some physical conditioning for his body, some shuriken jutsu, as well as bukijutsu, and the academy three since he didn't want to be caught although he knew preforming the regular bunshin wouldn't work because of how much chakra he had which was easily twice as much as Natsumi's while also knowing that she would never be able to preform the technique because of how much chakra she had which he roughly guessed was somewhere around mid Jonin level he did it outside of the village. Out of sight and hearing range of the Anbu, the Sandame who seemed to take an interest in his family for some reason or more specifically him, and his mother. But now, the civilians and shinobi were getting bolder due to the Sandame's inaction to do anything, attacking him when he was just a few blocks away from his home. It's time to go, Naruto told Thea, as he placed a backpack on his shoulders. Filled with food, water, some clothes, a few shuriken and kanai, as well as three scrolls one filled with various jutsu like, Kaden, Gokaku no jutsu, Futon, Datapa no jutsu, Sweden. Mizoropa no Jutsu, Wild Water Wave, and lastly Doden. Doroku Geishi no Jutsu, and the other had supplementary techniques that he had written down as well as the instructions for the Rasengan and the last scroll was filled with high-end Jutsu he thought would be cool to train with due to their usefulness. I still don't like the fact that you thought of that place you picked for us to hide in, Naruto-kun, Thea said, sounding a little uneasy. There's a reason why they call it, the Forest of Death, you know. Naruto's face however sported a look of conviction, as he hopped from tree to tree. Hence why no one will be able to look for us in there, he said, causing Thea's eyes to slightly narrow. And why wouldn't they? That place is a virtual death trap. Even the Anbu think twice before going into that place. Thea tried to reason, but Naruto kept going on. We're going in there, and that's final, he said, and the wolf girl's mouth opened and closed like a gaping fish, before sighing. You're nuts Naruto-kun, she said, while Naruto chuckled. It's who I am, Thea Chan, he said, you should know that. The young goddess only gave him a deadpan look, that's what concerns me. Naruto only laughed as he made a beeline towards their destination. Unknown to them however, they were being followed by several blurs. 45 minutes later outside perimeter fence of training ground 44, aka, Forest of Death. I still think that this is a bad idea, Thea said as they arrived at the fence to the infamous training ground. Are you a wolf goddess or a mouse? Naruto said, the only thing we have to look out for is that snake lady that lives here. The animals would most likely leave us alone because they would sense you. That doesn't mean that there are a few animals who are bold enough to attack us. The girl said, but before Naruto could comment on that, both of them felt several presences heading their way, she threw her hearing, instinct and sense of smell, while he had a version of the mind's eye of the Kagura a chakra sensor skill that he had read about which stated that some Uzumaki also had it, only his was getting stronger by the year, and if it got a certain degree larger he made a note to rename the technique. Anbu, at least a few of them, Naruto thought, and one of them is Nako chan You mean that pretty Anbu girl? Thea said, and if Naruto was a bit older, he would have noticed the small bit of jealousy Thea had unintentionally let slip. Now's not the time, Thea Chan, Naruto said, just as four Anbu arrived on the scene. One of them had long purple hair, was wearing a white cat mask with red lines, a white cloak and a Konoha tattoo on her left shoulder signifying that she was a captain and had a voluptuous figure accentuated by large DD cup borderline E cup S. Naruto, what are you doing here? The Anbu said, while Naruto still faced the fence, his face still having an indifferent expression. I need to be away from the village to be happy for once, and get away from those people. He said in a monotone voice, much to the woman's shock. The Anbu, Yugao Azuki knew his mother was neglecting him for his sister, 
and about his tortious treatment the civilians and some of the shinobi who held a grudge against the Kayubi gave him, secretly she was disgusted by their actions and wished to do something about it, but outwardly showed no emotion to what they did and bragged about when they got drunk at the bar, but she didn't know it was this bad. Naruto, please listen to me, the Anbu captain pleaded, whatever is happening at home between you and your family, you can talk to me about it. But for now, let's get you home. Even though Naruto was mostly indifferent, he still shed a single tear at the word. Home, in my heart, I wish that place did feel like home, he said, much to Yugao and the rest of the Anbu team's confusion, but I'm not wanted or needed there, since no one wants to give me even an ounce of love. Yugao's eyes widened at this, Naruto please. Don't talk like that. Naruto faintly gave a sad smile as he brought his hands into a hand sign. Sorry, Nako chan he whispered, but I need to do this. Cage Bunshin no Jutsu. To the surprise of the Anbu, in forty puffs of smoke, appeared forty perfect copies of the young boy. En Nani. Cage Bunshin, said one of the team members in shock while another gave their own response. But he's not even in the academy yet. How can he know such an advanced jutsu? Naruto while still facing the fence rubbed behind his neck, alerting the Anbu that he was the original, I sorta of broke into the cage vault where the forbidden scroll was, and copied the instructions for the jutsu, along with a few others, he said, before turning around and looking at the Anbu team, but more specifically Yugao. And tell Kashina and Natsumi that despite all the neglect and abuse that they have done to me, I don't hate them, Nako chan But, I no longer love them. And with a chakra-infused jump after his confession, Naruto and his clones sprinted into the forest. Shit, what do we do? shouted the last Anbu member, while Yugao cursed inwardly, knowing that one of the best uses for Cage Bunshin was to use them to throw any pursuers off the original's trail. Turning her head to one of her subordinates, she gave her orders, go get Tenzo and another team. And find Anko while you're at it, she knows the place better than anybody. The Anbu nodded then took off, and she turned towards the other two. You two go in after him. If the trail you're following is a decoy, double back and try another trail. The two Anbu were surprised by that, but that place is infected with monstrous animals, bugs, and who knows what else is in there. One of them said, before they felt killing intent directed at them. Get in there, or I will slice your legs off and leave you two for the predators in that forest to feast on, she growled out, making them quiver a bit. B but what are you going to do? The second one said, and swore he could feel her eyes narrowing underneath her mask. I'm going to inform the Hokage, and his mother, she said, now move. The two Anbu hesitantly, but surely darted into the forbidden training ground, and Yugo immediately turned around, and sped off heading straight for the Uzumaki, Namikaze home first. Meanwhile at the house Kashina Namikaze ne Uzumaki was in the kitchen of the house, cooking dinner for her family. As she thought about that, she remembered her only son, Naruto. A sad look crossed her face as she remembered how she neglected him for her daughter. She even remembered how she yelled at him, after trying to do tree climbing a basic chakra control exercise. The cruel words she used and the tone she used, no dot frightened, confused, and hurt him. And she didn't even realize this until after he fled, with a look of despair and fear on his face. Afterward she wanted to apologize, and went to his room that night. What she saw when she entered the room, made her regret even more what she did. Flashback. Naruto's room Kashina walked up to the door that led to her son's room, she grasped the knob and turned it slowly, before opening it, and in a corner of her mind realized this was the first time entering the room. As she walked in, she noticed that his room was spartan, and plain, and by plain I mean plain, and frowned at the lack of material objects in the room which reminded her of a prison cell if she was honest with herself with how bare it was, with the absence of toys, books, posters, or even clothes. Pushing away the thoughts of the state of his room for the moment, she noticed that Naruto was not on the bed, and began to panic, thinking he ran away, until she saw a mop of starlight silver hair belonging to her son on the other side of the bed. Walking to the other side, she froze and her eyes started to glisten with unshed tears as she saw her little boy sitting against the wall. Legs curled up, with his arms wrapped tightly around them, as if he was expecting to get hit. Naruto, the former native of Uzushio quietly said, as she carefully walked forward and knelt down. She slowly reached her hand forward and gently laid it on his shoulder. 
Seeing no immediate reaction, meaning he was asleep, Kashina stood up and pulled the covers of his bed back. She then bent down and carefully picked him up, so as not to startle him awake and gently laid him down on the mattress, and removed his shoes before pulling the covers over him. She took notice of the tear stains on his face, and felt disgusted at herself for overreacting the way she did that afternoon. She knelt and proceeded to run her ringers through his hair, which she felt was almost like the fluffy down from a swan chick. I'm sorry, my handsome Sochi, she said, which she meant because Naruto was unearthly handsome for a boy, enough so that she sometimes swore his face was carved by angels, still keeping quiet so as not to wake him, I didn't mean to react the way I did. I just. She then shook her head at that, no. There's no excuse, but please know that I still love and care about you, and I wouldn't allow anything to happen to you. She then reached over and gave her son on the forehead, and for some reason that she wasn't sure about at the time, also brushed her lips over his lightly just to get the barest taste of peppermint and raspberry from his mouth before pulling away in embarrassment, while trying to get her minor blush she developed under control. I'll try to spend more time with you if I can all right, and I promise to start training you after I finish your sisters, she said then stood up as a lone tear ran down her cheek and a small sad smile formed on her face. Good night, my little maelstrom, she said, I will always love you. And with that she left the room quietly, and let her son sleep. Dot. Flashback end. Ever since that day, she tried to spend a little time for her son. But, he would always leave very early in the morning, and wasn't seen much at all. Add to that Natsumi's study sessions for becoming the Namikaze heir that Kashina decided she would give to her and training sessions took a lot of time. Mostly due to the fact that she was progressing very slowly in trying to control the Kyubi's chakra, and learning the Uzumaki Taijutsu style the Uzuken which mentally depressed Kashina since that meant it was impossible for Natsumi to learn the advanced katas and some of the high-end intermediate katas for the style, but was surprised since Natsumi looked like she had some sort of skill in Fuenjutsu since she was moderately progressing in the art, and was currently at beginner level 6 in it. Add on to the fact that Kashina had also tested Natsumi to see if she inherited her special chakra for the chakra chains, which she did to a certain extent, but could only for the time be able to use the chains from the palms of her hands, and was also trying to come up with a training schedule for Naruto, to see him. However, she did promise herself that as soon as she had more time, she would try to bond more with her son. Her thoughts were disrupted by the arrival of her daughter and her caged bunshin, with the former being carried on the latter's back. Due to Natsumi overtraining herself in the hummingbird taijutsu style, a style that Minato used and created which relied mainly on speed, while also fainting, and delivering brutal strikes on the body's weak spots and pressure points which meant that one had to know about and study the anatomy of the body as well as being naturally fast to begin with that Kashina found out she was oddly proficient in, like she was made for it, but used the style with her creativity and imagination. That resulted in Natsumi trying to combine what she knew of the Uzuken to the Hachidori style, which surprisingly started to show results in that her daughter had theoretically come up with two techniques for it, however in order to perform them she needed to at least kick off the ground ten times in the blink of an eye for one, and be able to harden her fingers to pierce iron for the other. The red-haired woman only sighed at her daughter's eagerness to become stronger. Again. She asked her clone who sighed. Yep, it said, while Natsumi gave a sheepish grin. Sorry Ka-chan, said the female carbon copy of Minato, whom Kashina still missed even though for some reason she had started to sometimes forget general things about him like his birthday recently, almost as if she had come to terms with his death and was moving on, where he would then only be a distant memory, she thought, as the clone placed Natsumi on the ground. Now Natsumi was partly spoiled, mostly because her mother's attention was more on her than her brother Naruto. However she wasn't as arrogant as most spoiled children were. She helped clean around the house sometimes, if she wasn't hanging out with her friends and sometimes even made attempts to spend time with her brother. But didn't have much luck because he would disappear to who knows where outside the village. And when she did she wanted to impress him by showing him what techniques she had learned by her Ka-chan and pervy uncle Jiraiya when he came over from time to time, though to anyone else. It would look like she was teasing him. It also didn't help that Natsumi spoke in a way that she implied Kashina loved her more than Naruto. Which she might or might not have said a few times to him, to motivate him to gain their mother's approval, as well as pulled a few pranks then when people asked, 
She used Naruto as a scapegoat because she had seen other kids do it and getting away with it, and so not wanting to get into trouble and wanting to make friends and not knowing right from wrong she went along with what the other kids were doing. Kashina also saw that Natsumi was a little envious of Naruto, due to how much freedom he got, but also saw she was sad for him when he was yelled at one and a half years ago, and even though he hid it well, how lonely and depressed he felt, due to Natsumi's ability to sense negative emotions like her predecessor Mito Uzumaki. Kashina then smiled, happy that her little girl was not like a stuck-up Uchiha, no offense to her best friend Makoto and her eldest son, Itachi even though lately he seemed broody and emotionless which was kind of creepy to her. It's all right, Natsumi, she said, now, how about you go upstairs wash up and change out of your dirty clothes and get Naruto, dinner's almost ready. And with that Natsumi in a short burst of energy, bolted upstairs. While the clone puffed out of existence, causing Kashina to gain its memories and chuckle at some of her daughter's antics. Before she turned back to check on the food, about 45 minutes or so later when she was setting the plates, a series of urgent and desperate knocks at the door were heard. Sensei! Open the door! Shouted the familiar voice of one of Kashina's students Yugo, and by the sound of it, was panicked, it's important! Open up! Kashina then went back into the kitchen and turned the stove and oven off, and then began to head over to the door, until she was stopped when Natsumi came down in a hurry with a set of new clothes on after a shower and still had a towel wrapped around her hair with a panicked look on her face. Ka Chan. Oni Chan's not in his room, she said and the mother became concerned, as the knocking continued. Sensei, open the damn door, Yugao shouted again, and this time Kashina went over and opened the door, revealing her student in her Anbu uniform and gear, her mask removed, and her face having an urgent and pissed off look. Yugo. What's wrong? She asked. It's Naruto. The purple-haired woman said, now making the mother and daughter worried. What happened? She said, where is he? He went into the training ground 44. Yugo replied, and the house was quiet at that. Until. What? Kashina screamed, her eyes wide in horror at the mention of that training ground. The forest of death. What's he doing in there? The Uzumaki matriarch screamed out, now terrified for her son, for possibly the first time. He felt he was unwanted and unloved, and decided the best way to be happy was to leave, Yugo said, as signs of anger appeared on her face, he also said, that despite all of the neglect and abuse you have done to him he doesn't hate you, but no longer loves you anymore. The mother and sister of Naruto were shocked by those words. Un. Unwanted? Un. Loved? A abuse? Kashina thought, Naruto, you truly believe we didn't want you? She was broken out of her thoughts as her student continued, and that's not all. Apparently the civilians and some of the shinobi have been getting more brazen in their attacks on him, while the children play pranks and use him as a scapegoat to not get punished. Kashina's head snapped up at that, A attacked. She said in shock, while she knew that the general populace of Konoha were very antagonistic towards her son, she didn't expect them to attack him. Or for that matter the children of Konoha to use him as a scapegoat inwardly she was at least thankful Natsumi didn't do any pranking or frame him for them. However she didn't notice Natsumi adopting a look of realization and then horror which evolved into a mixture between sadness and despair on her face when she realized what she had unintentionally been a part of. Kashina's fists clenched as she realized how much of a fool, she really was. Yes, attacked, Yugao said heatedly, and the both of you didn't even bother to notice. Since you were too busy giving your attention to Natsumi and training her to even care. Sensei. Kashina wanted to retort but decided to focus on Naruto at the moment and went over to Natsumi who by now had tears beginning to well up in her eyes. My Masumi, she said, I am going to go with Yugo Chan to get your brother. I want you to stay here and lock all the doors and windows. Don't let anybody in or out okay. Natsumi who was now on the verge of crying nodded as Kashina went upstairs and into her room, and came back out in her Janin uniform, with her hair in a high ponytail and two bangs going down the sides of her face rode to ninja outfit. Though it was easy to see that it strained, and pushed against her large FF cup S that she could feel were still growing though she felt lately that the growth spurts her S experienced were beginning to subside, and wide hips something that irritated her to no end, and decided to get her make a modified uniform for herself in the future, she also made a note to herself not to make fun of Tsunade's chest size anymore. 
that she had gotten after the birth of the twins, and unknown to anyone including herself. A small portion of the Kyubi's chakra that was still inside of her, after the fox was ripped out of her, was part of the cause of her developing figure, as well as her deceptively insane hidden natural strength that could rival half of Tsunade's chakra enhanced strength in her womanly form, and massive chakra reserves that were being enhanced by it, and was also part of the reason how she survived getting impaled on the Kyubi's claw. Let's go, she said as she walked out of the house with tears beginning to fall from her eyes, shutting the door behind her. Natsumi, now alone looked out of the nearest window so she could see her mother and Yugao running down the street. Oni-chan please be all right, and I'm sorry, she thought, as the first of many tears fell from her right eye. Dot, with Naruto. Currently, Naruto was hopping from one branch to another, as he traversed the gigantic trees of the infamous Forest of Death. And so far, he hadn't run into any of the monstrous beasts he had heard about. The Anbu that had been tailing him which was part of his plan to ditch them when he put his hand behind his head to alert them to himself, each went after one of his cage bunshin, not knowing they were following a decoy after he used a Kawerimi with several different clones, and sent the rest to make traps to stall anyone else. Well, at least my decoys have them going the wrong way, Naruto said to Thea, while she just sighed. Yeah, that worked at least, the wolf-themed goddess said but now we have to worry about the animals and the snake lady. Also, it's getting late, and despite your Uzumaki longevity, you need to find a spot to crash for the night. And I suggest someplace high up in a tree. Naruto shook his head at that, no, that would be obvious, he said, we need to find someplace where it will be easy to hide, and harder for them to find. Thea could only blink, and sighed. But before she could talk to Naruto, her animal senses caused her to stiffen. Naruto-kun. Stop, Thea said, and the host of the new goddess did just that. What is it, Thea-chan? Naruto said, concerned for his best friend's warning. We're being watched, and it's not Anbu, those blank masked ones, or any other Konoha ninja. Thea said, greatly alarmed, I just caught a scent through you. It's wolf, but it's different. Naruto blinked at that. How different? Thea sniffed a bit, it smells strong, old. Also the closest thing that comes to my mind is prehistoric, she said and her eyes widened, and they have surrounded us. I can smell at least ten of them. Naruto's eyes widened as he pulled out a kunai from the backpack while listening and looking all around him, and inwardly being thankful he had the insight to bring some basic hand weapons with him. It was half a minute until he began hearing something. Growls and snarls were heard, before out of the shadows appeared a dozen wolves. But these were different from standard wolves as they were stronger and extremely larger, than what Naruto read about. They were around 18 meters long and looked to be a few tons. Their fur was white, except for two blue markings underneath each of their eyes, that had black sclera and pink irises. He also noticed that they had manes, now however. Naruto was inwardly beating himself up for not having the idea to bring a weapon such as a spear or a sword to use for protection which now that he thought about it would be pretty cool if he learned to use one, and decided that the first opportunity he got, he would learn Kenjutsu if he got out of this situation alive. The wolves then began to circle around the nervous boy, who was sweating bullets. Hey, Thea Chan, he said to his eternal companion, if I let you take over my body, would you be able to talk with them? Thea felt uneasy at that, I don't know. These guys are a different breed than what I'm familiar with. I can tell just by the size and smell. She said although she felt that they were kin for some reason deep inside her, but before Naruto could respond to that, a sharp howl that reverberated to the bone, caught their attention, as the supposed leader of the pack, who was 22 meters long, with a scar running down the left side of its face, had both of its eyes boring into his own. This doesn't look good, Naruto said, as the wolves began to approach him. Naruto-kun, kneel down, Thea commanded, while her container blinked. That's the matriarch of this group, I can tell by the scent. Kneel down, or she'll attack you. Naruto took Thea's advice and knelt down so he wouldn't be mauled to death by the she-wolf. The wolf continued its approach before stopping in front of Naruto and began sniffing him up and down. T this is starting to get weird, Naruto said nervously. Just relax Naruto-kun, Thea said, as the wolf continued to sniff before its eyes widened and began to back off. Naruto blinked in confusion, while still feeling nervous, at the she-wolf's actions. 
Uh, now what? He thought as the wolf then turned and seemed to glare at the other wolves, which resulted in them backing off and heading back into the forest. The female wolf then turned toward him and surprised Naruto by jerking her head to the side, as if telling him to follow her. What should we do? The young starlight-haired child thought to Thea, who only shrugged. We got nothing better to do. Let's follow her, the young goddess said, and Naruto hesitantly, began to follow the she-wolf. Meanwhile in another part of the forest of death. Get the hell out of my way. An angry, desperate voice shouted out, as a large beetle fell to the ground with its head cut off. The voice belonged to none other than Kashina Namikaze ne Uzumaki as she cleaved her way through many of the vicious beasts in the forest of death that were foolish enough to get in her way. Following behind her was none other than the Sandame Hirazen Serutobi, Yugo, Tenzo and Anbu who was once part of Orochimaru's experiments to recreate the Mokaton, a few other Anbu, as well as the forest of deaths, only resident, Anko Mitarashi. They stayed a few paces as Kashina had, borrowed, a katana from one of the Anbu, and was slicing, dicing, or using any sort of jutsu she knew on the unfortunate creatures to cross her path. I know I can be a sadist, but even I know not to mess with a mother, who is a strong s rank Kunoichi, Enko said with a small amount of fear, as she watched as Kashina proceeded to beat a giant tiger's skull in when it tried to swipe at her. Hiruzen could only look on with worry, seeing the state of his late successor's wife was in. He knew she was desperate to find Naruto, as everyone else was the same. But he could see that she was starting to become fatigued, and had used a lot of her chakra. He had to do something, or else she would hurt herself. Kashina, please stop. We have to go back. He said, as he saw her now strangling a large fox with a certain vindictive smirk on her face, issues much with her chains before using them to slam it to the ground, and turned to look back at them with a look of anger in her eyes. I'm not leaving Naruto out here in this damn place. I'd rather rot in hell than go back without him. She argued, as she back-fisted a huge bear in the face that was about to attack her, making said member of the Ursidae family fall to the ground swirly-eyed. We want him back just as much as you do. Hiruzen retorted, but with your current condition and you overusing your chakra, you could end up killing yourself. Kashina could only narrow her eyes as she kept moving forward, by now all the creatures in a one-kilometer radius were now hiding in fear from the red-headed woman's wrath. You can all go back if you want, but I'm no uh. She gasped out as she felt a chop to the back of the neck, her senses not warning her of it, due to her focusing them on getting her son back, and falling to the ground unconscious. I'm sorry sensei, but for your own and Natsumi's sake, I have to stop you, Yugao said, as she sighed then picked an unconscious Kashina off the ground and turned to Hiruzen who had a solemn look on his face. Come on everyone, he said. We'll continue looking for Naruto in the morning. With that the team of Shinobi vanished, as they departed the area. With Yugo's last thoughts being. Naruto. Kun be safe. Dot. Back with Naruto. Naruto yawned as he continued to follow the she-wolf. It was dark out and he was tired. How much further do we have to go? He thought, as they continued walking, I can barely keep my eyes open. Just hang on for a little while longer. Naruto kun. Thea said, I have a feeling we don't have to wait much longer. Naruto didn't say anything as he rubbed his eyes. It was another 40 minutes, before the she-wolf stopped between two humongous trees that even for the forest of death were big and gave a howl that jolted Naruto out of his drowsiness, and made him hurry up towards where the she-wolf was. When he got to where the she-wolf's head was, his eyes widened as he saw what looked like a village half the size of Konoha surrounded by a large wall with the hugest tree he ever saw in the center of the village, and behind the village a mountain range, that looked like it was some distance away. However, the village looked as though it was mostly abandoned for a long time, save for what looked like a few silver, white, and platinum-haired men and women living in it, due to the tall grass, and the vines on the walls. He was even further surprised to see whole scores of wolves, living outside the walls. Well this is something new, he said quietly before he was nudged forward by the she-wolf and continued walking forward with said wolf behind him. The other wolves looked at him curiously as the she-wolf followed behind. I got a bad feeling about this, the silverette thought as they entered through the gate of the village. You're not the only one, said Thea, as they walked forward down the street toward what looked like the largest building that was at the base of the tree in the center of the village. Which was a castle, Tsuruga castle, but it was partially covered in vines, 
and like the surrounding buildings, were made of stone that was a grey colour. He could see a duo of wolves that were coloured the same as the she-wolf only they had brown streaks in their fur standing guard and when he stopped, only to be nudged by the she-wolf again, the guard wolves snapped to attention and began growling threateningly. The she-wolf moved in front and gave a series of small growls and barks, which made the two guards stand down. Then the she-wolf turned towards Naruto, and to his shock spoke. Inside human, the wolf said in a clearly female voice, but its mouth didn't move, meaning that it was telepathic. Why you can talk? The silverette said, while the wolf nodded. Only through thoughts, until I reach Omega. The wolf said, and I heard every word you have spoken to your tenant since I first saw you. Naruto's eyes widened at that, but before he could speak, the she-wolf told him again to go inside the building, telling him she'll explain later. With no other choice, and not wanting to piss the she-wolf off, Naruto went inside the building. One of the guard wolves led him through a foyer, and several hallways before arriving at what looked like a living room of sorts for a house, before arriving at a set of stairs. After climbing them they arrived at a bedroom, that was in moderately decent condition, with a bed, closet, desk, and a shelf beside the desk full of books ranging in all manner of subjects, a bedside table that had a lamp on it for late night reading, and small bathroom connected to it, as well as a few windows and in one of them the she-wolf was watching him with one of her eyes, and upon arrival the guard wolf left, to return to its post. Get some rest, child, the she-wolf said, and all of your emotions will be answered tomorrow when you meet the alpha of our pack. She then began to leave, but before she took a few steps away from the building, Naruto stopped her. Wait, can you please, at least tell me what your name is? He asked, as he opened the window she had previously been looking through, and the wolf turned back, and answered him. It's Shikan, the wolf said, now, rest. With that said Shikan left, leaving the boy alone in the room. Naruto sighed as took off his backpack and laid it down next to the bed, and sat down on the bed, and was amazed at how comfortable it felt. Man, I was not expecting this, Thea Chan, he said as he positioned himself, and laid down on the bed. I know, Naruto kun, Thea said, but for now, let's sleep. We'll find out more in the morning. Naruto nodded, then took the covers of the bed and pulled them over himself, and fell asleep. Kashina's eyes snapped open as she found herself back in the living room of the family's house, which while not the size of a humongous five-story mansion, was around three stories with an attic and has two basements which the first basement had a sauna, steam room, indoor pool, weight room, and janitorial closet. And the second basement was a large indoor artificially created training field that had a small waterfall that had a stream connected to a decent but shallow lake and a small forest with a clearing that had several wooden posts that had repair seals on them which regenerated the posts whenever they were damaged in it for taijutsu and kenjutsu practice and that the ceiling had seals which made it look like the sky outside, and to mirror the weather, without any negative effects. While the first floor had a foyer, ballroom, formal living room, formal dining room, formal meeting room, family living room where Kashina was currently in, family dining room, kitchen, two bathrooms, miniature clinic with a small bathroom, janitorial closet and indoor greenhouse while the second floor has 12 bedrooms ranging in size and four bathrooms along with a master bedroom that also has a bathroom connected to it while the third floor had a large library and a study for more creative and dangerous techniques stored inside it while the attic wasn't really an attic but a sunroom that had a large indoor garden growing inside it now the strange thing about all of this was that the whole place was black white and gray while only she was normal the confused woman looked at her hands, with a look of utter shock on her face. W what's going on? Where am I? She thought to herself, but was cut off as she began to hear a voice. That she immediately identified as herself. And by the sound of it, the voice was yelling at someone. It then hit her, as her eyes widened and she ran for the kitchen, where she saw the calendar and her heart sank. She remembered this date all too well. No. Please not again. Anything but this she screamed in her head, as the yelling outside intensified. She then bolted for the back door that the kitchen was connected to, and opened it, and to her shock and horror, saw a colored version of herself, and Naruto in the equally colored backyard, with the later looking terrified as tears ran down his cheeks. You stupid little bastard! What were you thinking doing a chakra exercise without my permission? The past Kashina yelled at Naruto. 
B but KK Ka Chan. I I. The young starlight haired boy said, only to receive a hard slap from past Kashina. That's enough out of you. I can't believe a little waste of space like you would try to pull a stunt like this. The past Kashina screeched, making the present Kashina wince at the words, as tears leaked from her eyes and fell down her cheeks. No. Stop this. Please. She begged to any deity out there to stop this travesty, only for it to fall on deaf ears as the specter of herself continued to shout at Naruto who was now curled up in a ball crying. Then to her confusion and unease, a sinister grin formed on the mouth of her past self. It's obvious that you are an incooperative little shit stain, said the past Kashina while a dark sinister gleam appeared in her eyes. And I know what happens to incooperative little brats, she said while the real Kashina looked on, clearly confused by this. W wait? What's going on here? This is not right. I sent Naruto to his room, Kashina thought, as past Kashina pulled out a Hiroshin Kanai, while making a clone. And it's not like anyone would care. The whole village already despises him, so they'll see this as a blessing rather than a murder, past Kashina said, making present Kashina's eyes widen in horror at that. Before any thought of doing anything to help Naruto could enter her mind, the clone of her supposed past self, used rusted spiked chakra chains that came out of her back, and strung Naruto up by the neck while slightly cutting into it drawing a little blood, and spreading his arms and legs out. His face now showing true fear as he looked at both past Kashina and her clone. Keika Chan. Please. Naruto begged, but the grins on both of their faces only increased. Sorry, Naruto Chan. But I never wanted you. Natsumi is my favorite, and I could always go into town and make her a new little brother, the past Kashina said in a sickly sweet singsong voice, and then another chakra chain came out of the clone's back, and the kanai tip went speeding at the five and a half year old piercing him in the shin. Which resulted in the little boy screaming out in pain. The real Kashina looked on in horror at what just happened, she remembered clearly that this is not what happened. No. This is wrong. This is all wrong. The Uzumaki screamed at herself, this isn't what happened. She then saw past Kashina fling the Hiroshin Kanai behind Naruto before disappearing in a red flash, then reappear behind Naruto, with a familiar spiraling ball of chakra in her hand. Rasengan. Past Kashina shouted as she slammed the chakra ball which was about twice the size of a regular one into Naruto's back carving a spiral trench into it that began to splurt, and leak blood from the wounds, causing said boy to cry out in agony. While some blood landed on past Kashina's face, which she licked off, and in doing so, she briefly got an orgasmic expression on her face. And oh, stop it! Kashina screamed as she tried to run and help her son, only for something to grab onto her left ankle and cut into it. She looked down and saw what looked like a black and green vine covered in thorns and had pulsating indigo veins, growing from the ground and wrapping itself around her ankle. She reached for her kanai pouch, but was shocked to find it not on her thigh, she is still wearing the road to ninja outfit. Desperation taking hold, she clawed at the thorn-covered vines, trying to get free to save her child from this torture, let go of me. She then heard another scream and turned back. Her eyes widening as another chakra chain impaled itself into Naruto's other shin, then two more to his forearms. Panic settled in as the red habanero now struggled more than ever to get to Naruto, but then more black and green vines grabbed her right wrist and yanked it back, while cutting into it as well. Kashina then watched as the past Kashina whose clothes turned into a skimpy crimson dominatrix outfit suddenly began turning into a taller, demonic, ugly version of herself who grew from her and present Kashina's height of 5 feet. 4 inches to a solid 6 feet, 0, and her skin turned chalk white. While most of it horribly burned and what didn't burn grew horrendous boils that secreted a dark indigo ooze that smelt foul. Like it was from a decayed 5-day-old corpse and when it hit the ground. The ground that the ooze dropped on would begin to melt. Meaning that the ooze was extremely poisonous. Her hair became a greasy mess with clumps falling out while it gained white highlights and tips. While six yellow horns grew out of the sides of her head, they look like Vasto Lord Ichigo horns. Where a pair faces up, another down, and a pair in between them was straight out. Two rabbit ears that were made out of a bone like substance grew out of the top of her head, they look like Kagaya Otsutsuki's horns. Four crimson wings that had white spikes on the undersides of them grew out of her back with the lower pair circling around her hips, 
The wings look like the ones that Giratina has, and a horribly burned fox tail that had clumps of hair missing in the places it wasn't burnt growing out of her spine that if she looked closely would have been crimson with a white tip. And a white half bone mask with razor sharp pointed crimson teeth set into a sinister grin formed over her mouth and neck, and her eyes became two glowing red orbs in black pools, and lastly a black hole that was of a decent size opening up in her enlarged chest area which grew from past Kashina's current FF cups to solid J's where her heart should have been, with the same thing happening to the clone except it had blue skin and a black dominatrix outfit instead. Then all of a sudden two guando, burst from the ground, their blades rusted and old that had a red tint to them with thin trails of smoke coming from the tips. Now for the final touch. The now demonic Kashina said as she took hold of one of the guando and yanked it out of the ground and began twirling it with the skill of a master, with the clone following suit. Yes. It's time to put this bad dog to sleep. For good. The clone said as it stabbed the blade end into Naruto's stomach, upon which the area around the blade began to burn showing that the guandos were extremely hot, and forcing a strangled cry of pain from the young silverette. Then the past demonic Kashina proceeded to skip towards the chain-bound boy while still twirling her guando. Oh Naru chan Naru chan The demonic Kashina said, as the real one continued to struggle while watching what was happening not 15 feet in front of her, and as this torture was going on in front of present Kashina the vines were continuing to dig into her left ankle and right wrist. If only you were a good boy, then you wouldn't be having this punishment. Present Kashina could only growl as this. Thing spoke to her son but what the demonic Kashina did and said next, made her blood freeze. It is a pity, I'll miss that delicious blood of yours but now, you die. With that phrase, the demonic Kashina shoved the guando into Naruto's neck, said boy then began choking on his own blood as his eyes went blank, and his throat began burning, however what was strange was that the demonic Kashina was looking straight at present Kashina, when she did it. The look of horror on Kashina's face was clear as day as she saw one of her precious children die in front of her. And no. No, she screamed just as the vines, chakra chains, and the demonic version of herself and its clone vanished, when Naruto who still had the guando in his neck hit the ground. The distraught mother immediately rushed over to her son. Ignoring the pain in her left leg and right arm for the moment, and scooped him into her arms, after being as careful as possibly being able to given her circumstances to remove the polearm from his throat not noticing that the guando repaired itself, and in case you are wondering it's a golden dragon guando and that the dragon on the blade is red, the tassel is black, the gems are dark indigo in color and that the guard is made of red gold. Tears cascaded from her eyes as she looked at his small burnt, unmoving body. The world around them, save for the guando that was now in perfect, condition fading into darkness. Naruto? Naruto? Kashina wailed, as she tried to wake him, but with no results as his eyes were glassed over, and lifeless. The mother seeing no response, cradled her son's body, while rocking back and forth. And Naruto. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. My baby, she said, in complete despair. Why? A voice barely above a whisper rasped out, causing Kashina to jerk her head up and look around, only to hear a rasping breath coming from her supposed to be dead son. Looking down at Naruto. Her eyes widened in horror as she saw his face, in which he had slightly thicker whisker marks, two fangs coming from his mouth, and eyes that were sky blue with a slitted silver pupil. Why do you hate and forsake me? For those of you who are 15 or so and younger, you can read now, unless you disregarded the warning, then in that case disregard this captioned sentence. End of nightmare. Kashina jolted awake with a scream, sweat covering her entire form and drenching her clothes. She was in the master bedroom of the family home. Remembering the horrifying nightmare, she had, she curled up against the head of the bed and started crying, then numerous footsteps were heard as the door flew open, revealing a concerned Sandame Hokage, Hirazan Serutobi. Kashina. Are you alright? The Sandame said worriedly, as Yugo, along with two other people, which were Kakashi Hataki, and another Anbu with a cat mask. They watched as their Hokage headed over to Kashina who looked as if she had seen the devil himself, or in this case herself. Kashina. Kashina talked to me, Hiruzen said as he carefully placed a hand on her shoulder, which resulted in Kashina jerking her head up and back pedaling against the wall. Kashina calmed down. It's me, Hiruzen said as he moved toward Kashina, which seemed to scare her more. Knowing he had to do something fast, he moved forward and grabbed the clearly distraught Uzumaki 
who began to struggle with much distress. Shish, Kashina, Shish, the old cage said calmly, and repeated the process until she calmed down, and then hugged, not in a perverted fashion. The Hokage and began sobbing, It's okay, Kashina. Now, tell me what happened. However, Kashina could only cry more as she remembered the horrible nightmare, I I. See can't. I it was s so. Horrible. She cried out between sobs, and Hiruzen then turned to the cat masked Anbu. Go and get Inoichi, now. Tell him it's an emergency, and that I need him, right away. The Sandame ordered. The Anbu nodded then vanished in a shunshun. It was at this moment that Natsumi, who up until this point had been crying her heart out on the bed in her room and had recently stopped had heard her mother scream, followed by numerous footsteps outside her room, so deciding to find out what the cause was, she came in, though if anyone noticed they would have seen that her eyes were puffy, concerned about her mother. She was about to speak, when Kakashi stopped her and shook his head. Your mother just had a nightmare, Natsumi-chan, he said, it would be best if you didn't disturb her right now. Natsumi wanted to protest this, but knowing she wouldn't win an argument and that she was tired simply nodded, and left with Kakashi. Yugo stayed though, and as she looked at her sensei who was being comforted by the sandame, the regular type of comforting when one person comforts another, any other way is just wrong, was curious about what the nightmare had been, but also had a good suspicion as to what, or who it was about. About 20 minutes later, Inoichi arrived and saw the state the former Jinchuriki was in, and immediately knew that this was bad. Hokage-sama, I came as soon as I was informed by the Anbu, the Yamanaka clan head said as he approached the two. And a good thing you did Inoichi, Hiruzen said as he continued to hold his late successor's wife, Kashina had a nightmare. And judging by the way she woke up from it, I can only guess it was a terrifying experience for her. Inoichi nodded as he looked at the quietly sobbing Uzumaki, as she uttered her son's name over and over. And you want me to use my Shintenshin no Jutsu to see what her what her nightmare was, he said, knowing perfectly well what the Hokage wanted as he nodded his head. Yes, I need to know what it was about, he said, and Inoichi nodded as he turned to Kashina. Kashina, listen to me, Inoichi said, getting the woman's attention as she lifted her head revealing her tear-stained face and red puffy eyes, I know you just woke up from a nightmare, but I need to go into your mind and find out what it was. Can you relax so that I can do this? Kashina was silent for a bit but hesitantly nodded her head, as Hiruzen stood up and gave the two some space. After bringing a chair to the side of the bed, Inoichi instructed Kashina to get on it, and when she did he raised his hands in the signature hand sign for the technique, before going limp and inside Kashina's mind, causing said woman to also go limp and fall onto her pillows. It was around 15 minutes later, when Kashina and Inoichi woke up again with a start, the latter's face even though he worked at the torture and interrogation department and was desensitized to such things, was showing shock and horror. Kami have mercy, he said, as he placed his hand on his head in order to alleviate the memories of the hell he just saw. Inoichi, what is it? Hiruzen said in worry as he helped Kashina sit back up. The Yamanaka clan head could only look at him with a pale face, his eyes showing a thousand-yard stare, and shaking at the images he observed as well. I can only say this Hiruzen, he said calmly, but with a tinge of fear in it, what I saw in there, you wouldn't like it. Hiruzen blinked at that, what was so horrible, that it scared Kashina who was normally brave, half to death. He then moved towards the Yamanaka who looked as if he was ready to vomit. Let me see it, he said firmly making Inoichi and Kashina jerk their heads toward him. Hiruzen, no, I don't want you to see it. Kashina begged, with Inoichi agreeing with her. Trust her and me on this Hiruzen. You don't want to, he argued, as the old Hokage nodded. You're right, I don't want to, Hiruzen said, until he gave a determined look, but I need to. Because whatever it was that frightened Kashina so bad, it no dot concerns Naruto and that I am also partly responsible for what had happened to cause him to run. He then narrowed his eyes, so I am ordering you, Inoichi. Let me see what you found in Kashina's mind. Kashina looked at the old cage with worry. Hiruzen. Inoichi could only blink at that, but motioned for Hiruzen to sit. Don't say that I didn't warn you, the Yamanaka clan had said, as he proceeded to share what he saw in Kashina's nightmare. When Inoichi finished, he immediately saw the reaction he knew would happen, as Hiruzen paled, 
and proceeded to grab the nearest waste basket and puke his guts out. Merciful heavens, he thought to himself, that was. I don't even know how to describe it. The Hokage, after he stopped hurling his stomach contents out which was whatever he had for dinner, and settled down, stood up and walked towards the bed and proceeded to wrap Kashina in a hug. Listen to me Kashina, what you saw in that nightmare wasn't you, he whispered into her ear, that never happened, and never will happen. I know you would rather kill yourself before you ever hurt one of your children. Especially Naruto. Kashina after hearing Hiruzen only began to sob more as he then turned towards Inoichi. Thank you, you can go home now, Inoichi, he said, and the man nodded before whispering something into Hiruzen's ear then leaving, along with Hiruzen who left shortly afterward as well but not before saying some words of comfort to Kashina, while the whole time Yugao looked on. What nightmare could it be that it would frighten one S rank Kunoichi and S rank Shinobi and an A rank one? She thought to herself, as she left as well, but not before noticing what looked like a weapon similar to a Naginata, only that the blade was broader and that it was ornately designed on the other side of Kashina's bed, which made her think that Kashina was learning how to use it and didn't bring it on her search for Naruto, because she wasn't proficient in using it yet. She also thought it must have been a trick of the light when the dragon on the blade glowed a little and the shadows seemed drawn to it, she then made a mental note to herself not to eat ramen and drink sake after 12 a.m. And unknown to anyone, even Kashina was that the beginnings of two black and green vine-like tattoos appeared on her left ankle and right wrist, giving off both a pleasant and foreboding feeling to anyone who would pay attention to them in the future. Unknown location, so they think I'm not real huh, fools. I will show them, the nightmare for Kashina is only going to get so much worse before getting better, for me that is muahahahaha, but don't worry Kushi-chan after I'm done with you, I'll make sure Sumi-chan gets hers too. After all you both hurt my sweet, handsome Naru-chan. I'll be sure to make the both of you pay. Quote dot 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 dot. But first I'll lay low for a bit longer, don't want the damn mindwalker to be tipped off this early in the game, then at the end, Naru-chan, I will have you all to myself, yes I will, and no skank will have what is mine. M-U-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A. Outside the Namikaze, Uzumaki house. What did you want to talk to me about, Inoichi? Hiruzen said, as the both of them were walking towards the Yamanaka compound. It's about that nightmare if it can actually be called that, Hokage-sama did you notice that it seemed off to you, like I don't know that there was something else there. Inoichi asked, as when he was viewing it he noticed, that the past demonic Kashina had even though he didn't see it he was sure, she glanced several times at where Kashina was, and not just when Kashina originally had the nightmare but after, when he Kashina, and Hiruzen had reviewed it, twice for himself and Kashina and once for Hiruzen. Not really other than it seemed lifelike, you're just overthinking this Inoichi. Hiruzen said, as he thought that all the guilt that Kashina kept inside all these years was beginning to come out, he also thought that the nightmare was that bad because she had recently learned some of the truth about what was happening to her son over the years, and that her subconscious mind created a worst-case scenario so to speak for her fears. And in most cases he would be right. I guess so, but I'm still going to schedule several appointments for her just to be on the safe side. Inoichi replied, while beginning to walk to his house. And as he was doing so, deep inside himself he couldn't help but feel a sense of dread swell up inside him. Back in the Forest of Death, are known as Training Ground 44. As morning came over the compound in the compound in the Forest of Death, one silver-haired Jinchuriki was still sleeping as the door to his room opened. Two pairs of eyes that were blue-green and magenta, though they had pink flecks in them peeked inside and saw the human on the bed. Naruto remained asleep on the bed, unaware of the two figures headed towards him. When they arrived at the foot of the bed, they crouched down, and then as one, leapt on the sleeping seven-year-old. The results were obvious. Ah, Naruto screamed, as he felt the weight of something furry, and smelled like the forest land on him, what the? Hey, get off of me. The two things that, attacked, him were two wolf pups. They were colored the same way as the other wolves he saw last night. But there were some differences. One had black markings under its magenta-colored eyes, and had black highlights in its fur as well as four black socks, while the other had red markings under its blue-green eyes, as well as red highlights in its fur and four red socks. Hey, 
Come on. Get off. Naruto shouted again. It was then that the pup with the blue-green eyes spoke to him, in a young girl's voice. Shikan Itoko-sama sent us to get you, so up and at him. The pup shouted, and then proceeded to grab him, by biting his hand and dragging him out of the bed. Ow! Let go of my hand! The silverette shouted again, but the young pup ignored him and continued to pull Naruto out of the room with the other wolf pup following right behind. They led Naruto out of the castle, down the main road where they passed a few of the silver, white, and platinum-haired people going about their day and saw the comical scene amusing, before exiting the compound. Where the wolves outside of the gate also saw the comical scene, and Naruto swore that he heard some of them snickering. It was two hours later before they arrived at the base of a large hill, that in itself was tiny compared to the mountains behind it, with a cave opening big enough for something a bit larger than the size of a boss summoned to enter into. Outside the cave was Shikan, along with two other wolves, and unlike the guard wolves at the castle, these were at least 50 meters long, though were still diminutive compared to the size of the cave opening. The young pups brought the runaway silverette in front of Shikan who looked on with a neutral gaze. I assume you slept well child, Shikan said, while Naruto who was rubbing the back of his hand, and glaring at the female wolf pup who had dragged him the whole way, nodded. Yeah, I did, he said, but did you have to send these little hellions to get me? I swear I thought that she was going to rip my hand off. Said pup only gave an innocent look, I was only doing was I was told, she said sweetly, and before Naruto could make a retort, Shikan stopped them. You'll both have enough time to maul each other later, the she-wolf said, for now, the alpha wishes to see you, child. Naruto frowned at that, my name is Naruto, you know, he said, and the she-wolf looked at him. Of course, she said, now, follow me, Naruto. Naruto's eyes slightly twitched at that, geez, does she have to talk like a drone, me muttered, only for Shikan to answer. I heard that, oh and you too. I heard from someone that you skipped out on her lessons yesterday, I'll be sure to tell her later about what you did, she said, and Naruto felt a sudden chill go down her spine, while if he was looking and paying attention to his surroundings he would have seen the pups pale several shades and the two guards to snicker slightly, while one of them whispered something about being busted to the other. However, a yawn inside Naruto's mind then got his attention. It would be best not to piss her off, Naruto-kun, Thea said, as she stretched within his mindscape. She could tear us limb from limb. And I prefer to live long after I get my final tail. Naruto mentally gave his eternal companion the equivalent of a deadpan stare inside his mindscape. You're not helping here, he thought, as he followed the she wolf inside the cave opening, which led to a tunnel, with the now two cowed wolf pups, who each sent a glare to the guard wolves, shutting them up, following behind him. For 50 minutes, they walked through the tunnel and Naruto was curious why they had not experienced total cave darkness yet as well as why he felt as if he was going downhill. Before he could ask, he saw light at the end of the tunnel and soon the group of three wolves and one avatar a name he dubbed himself to be different from the known Jinchuriki, arrived in what appeared to be an enormous cavern, with a hole in the ceiling allowing sunlight to enter. Naruto looked around and saw more wolves, who were warily looking at him, along with numerous eyes watching him from the shadows of the cavern especially one pair that caught Naruto's attention for some reason, and made him cautious from the way that they were showing no hostility. Well, at least they're not trying to eat me. Yet, Naruto thought, while Thea suddenly admonished him. Don't jinx us Naruto-kun. The young goddess shouted, anything that could happen, will happen. Jeesh, fine, I'm sorry. Naruto replied with a roll of his eyes. His thoughts were interrupted as he saw Shikan stop in front of a formation of rocks that looked like a podium. The avatar stopped walking as soon as Shikan did, and the group waited until a massive wolf with black fur even bigger than Gamabunta appeared out of the shadows, it looked grizzled, as well as having a beard, and the majority of its top right fang was missing, it gazed down at the starlight-haired boy with eyes that were beady and completely blank, not showing irises and pupils that were surrounded by large, round pools of shadow and they were the eyes that showed no hostility at the boy, only curiosity. Well young human, the wolf said in a gruff, but strong voice, I'm impressed how you managed to survive the forest where we made our home, ever since Shikan informed me about you. But I am curious, about why you came into the forest, when others have second thoughts. Naruto gave a sigh, somehow he knew that explaining his story would make things a little, troublesome. 
and as he thought that he swore he could have heard two people sneezing from where he was, followed by the sound of a frying pan smacking something, then a grunt. A single twelve-year-old who looked as if he was around two years older than he actually was. Silverette with white highlights in his shoulder-length spiky hair, though it was more of a tame spiky than wild spiky, and red tips as well as now having a few auburn streaks here and there. Purple-eyed boy whose irises now had two rings of teal in them, and three vertical scares underneath his left eye that extended to his left ear and three thin whisker marks on each cheek, who also had a black-edged in burgundy eye patch on his right eye that had the kanji for suppression on it was outside the seemingly abandoned compound, practicing Akita for an advanced Kenjutsu style he found in the compound's library. He was at the height of five feet eight and a half and was wearing a black vest with burgundy trim over a burgundy shirt that clung to his body like a second skin revealing a muscular body that was built for endurance, speed, strength, and agility with a six-pack and was on the beginning stages of having another set of abs. Think about him having a body similar to Bardock. He was also wearing a burgundy belt, with a buckle that was a silver disc with what resembled a wolf howling at the full moon in a starry sky. Three pouches on the left side, one each for kanai and explosive notes shuriken and senban along with ninja wire and on the right side was a battle claw looks like a skull bones gauntlet style hand claw only the blades are made out of a whitish silver material and that instead of skulls the claw has wolf heads on it and a black sheath with a burgundy floral pattern going down it that looked like it was for a wakazashi but had the inside expanded with the use of a space expansion seal for an o katana he was currently wielding it looks like katana yoto hatamanba only the suka has leather wraps that were burgundy in color, has no suba, and is an o katana. Under the belt he wore black cargo pants with burgundy stripes going down the sides, burgundy tabi socks and black geta sandals. As well as a black scarf wrapped around his neck with one of the ends hanging down his front that he could use to cover the lower half of his face with if he felt like doing so, a pair of fingerless burgundy gloves on his hands that had seals on the palms with black metal plates on the back of them along with black bandages wrapped around his right arm, from his wrist to his elbow. To finish what he is wearing, he has a black open sleeveless trench coat with burgundy lining and a high collar, that coat that Ibiki wears, except no sleeves, and black leather shoulder pauldrons that had wolf heads engraved on them attached to it, that he wore over his vest. And lastly all of his clothing was weighted, and the coat itself forces him to constantly work out because of counter springs in the shoulders that he personally installed in the coat that constantly apply a pressure of around 90 pounds, 41 kilograms force or 400 n. If anyone wants to make a picture of him on DeviantArt be my guest. This was Naruto Uzumaki, now a pre-teen and ready to leave the forest, and back into the village. He had made a few trips into the village and other places in Hai no Kuni over the years, mostly for him to get a little experience in going after bandits, but only stayed for half an hour when he was in the village, and stuck to the shadows so he wouldn't be found. He had stayed at the compound, which the wolves, known as the Batoru Urufu, if you guessed battle wolves from Toriko, pat yourself on the back for you get a cyber cookie. I'll also use their English name from now on unless Naruto is talking to different people then he will use the Japanese translation, had helped him after he told them how he ran away from his home, feeling unwanted, and unloved, and wanted to become stronger. He even gave his secret that he was the avatar, he title he dubbed himself last chapter, of Thea, much to the Alpha's intrigue, and the other's shock. Though Shakan already knew, the former, the Alpha of the Wolves approached him and after sniffing him once and saying what he thought was a technique called Janesu Saki, where Naruto swore his body turned white like a cast-off husk, where it seemed like his soul was ed right out of his body for a few minutes, the wolf after gaining the equivalent of a thoughtful look for a wolf, nodded and said to him that he told the truth. The wolf then introduced himself as Janesu, Guinness, the alpha of the battle wolves, and the only wolf who held the title of Wolf King. He then told Naruto how he and his pack were the last of their kind after most of them died off due to natural disasters, that he and his pack were able to survive, because of his sensitivity to nature, much like how small animals can sense predatory threats, changes in the weather, or imminent natural disasters. This, sensitivity, allowed him to sense even tiny occurrences across the planet which had proved essential to his pack's survival, to a far greater extent than even the keenest of animals, as well as being hunted by poachers, and ninja who saw them as a threat. He explained that they were protected by a clan of samurai ninja monks. 
known as the Shizen, who themselves were the combination of a samurai clan known as the Mibu, some early Uzumaki who split away from their kin, an Otsutsuki branch member whose name was Jiro who had the Tensegen after he took a Hayuga's Dujutsu that he had killed in battle and implanted it in himself, and some Chinoik members as well who brought the wolves to the forest that eventually became the Forest of Death before Konoha's founding. One of the Shizen's abilities was the ability to talk telepathically to animals, and taught the wolves how to do it, which the wolves then expanded upon to speak vocally. The wolves and humans coexisted in peace for near 400 years, until when around the time that the village of Kanahagakur no Sato was founded by Madara Uchiha and Hiroshima Senju. The clan leader at the time, Mokuzai Shizen, told the pack to stay in the compound while he formed a Senjutsu J. Ikuken Genjutsu hybrid barrier that kept anyone from entering the grounds. While at the same time expanding the inside, to keep up with the growth of the battle wolf population, as well as making time slow down by a factor of three to also help speed up the growth of the wolf population, but there was a side effect in that in two places inside of the barrier that the wolves found, the time actually sped up by a factor of three to keep balance with most of the area inside the barrier slowing down unless they were brought there by the inhabitants themselves. The barrier Mokuzai made was also the reason why no one in every Chunin exam that Konoha had sponsored, had ever found the place. And before he left, he made a failsafe blood seal on the library door that had three functions. To glow a rich green and opening if a Shizen clan member came into contact with the seal, for the seal to turn a lighter shade of green how light it was depended on how distantly related they were, if a descendant of them came back upon which Mokuzai left instructions with Ginasu on how for them to open the library if that was the case, and to glow crimson and incinerate anyone not related who tried to enter. Unfortunately, the Shizen, for before they left, the clan experienced a major pandemic, that wiped out most of them, except for 35 members that had grown an immunity to the disease, with Mokuzai being one of them, never returned, and the pack assumed that they were wiped out. Naruto was awed after he was told this story. Though inwardly he couldn't explain why he was saddened at the clan's extinction, he then asked Ginasu what would happen to him. The ancient king's surprising response was that Naruto was allowed to use whatever he needed to do his training and would personally train him as well, but restricted him to go to the nursery, due to that area being where the newborn cubs were born, it was also the larger of the two places that the wolves found where time was sped up, which was ideal for them to give birth in, since it gave the wolves an unnaturally long lifespan once they left the area where they were born, the downside they physically aged really slowly. Naruto nodded in understanding at that, knowing a pregnant wolf giving birth was more protective and dangerous, and would kill him with no hesitation. So for the past five years that went on outside the barrier, Naruto had lived, trained, slept, and learned at the former Shizen compound. He even made friends with the two wolf pups who were born inside of the place that time was sped up, Rias the pup with the red highlights in her fur, and Akno the wolf with black highlights. The two became familiars to Naruto, like how the Inazuka had Ninkan, and the three became notorious for their mischief. Or rather Rias and Akino would, while Naruto was trying to stop them from going overboard. He failed most of the time, and got punished with the two by association to their schemes, he didn't know why but was thankful that she administered his punishment. However, it was weird that the punishment she gave to him, was for him to give her a massage every time, saying something about he needed to be good at it, he didn't complain since apparently from the moaning she did when he gave her one he assumed he was decent enough, the other two well, the less said the better. Speaking of the two, his eye widened in realization as he sensed, crud to late. Oof. Two mostly white blurs about three quarters the size of Sum Inazuka's Ninkan partner Kuromaru slammed into the silverette forcing him to fall on his back, with the two canines licking his face, a habit they had began recently, causing him to laugh and begging them to stop. Oi, come on girls, settle down, no, not there, Naruto shouted while hearing their laughter through his mind. Eventually the two stopped the torture of, their, avatar. Ginasu Gigi wants to see you, Naruto-kun. Rias said, he said something about you needing to return to Konoha. Naruto sighed solemnly at that, return, huh, he said. The Silverette had recently began having dreams of when he would return. Most of them not good. The shinobi in training had sometimes wondered how his mother and sister would react seeing him. Would they ignore him like they used to? 
Shout in anger, though it only happened the one time. Use him as a scapegoat for their mischief. Whatever. He didn't care anymore, or want to know. He couldn't tell his mother at the time or the people who supposedly protected him, which now that he thought about it, he only saw the Anbu weasel, and Nako actually doing their job in protecting him, know about how the civilians and shinobi would abuse him, thinking that she would look down on him even more than usual, and so whenever a group of them would attack and threaten to kill him if he ever told his mother, he would keep his mouth shut, not knowing what he should have done. But one thing was certain now, he was prepared to dish out pain to anyone who had any thought of ganging up on him again. And while he was not prepared to deal with shinobi higher than Anbu rank at the moment, as he currently was, he was strong enough to deal with any mid-level Jonin, although that was partly due to not having much experience with fighting shinobi if any. Including the fact that he and the wolves were judging himself based on past Shizen, and Uzumaki standards who lived during the clan wars era. And during the years, with the help of a personal tutor that Ginasu assigned to teach Naruto, which one of the silver-haired residents of the village had volunteered for the position. He learned from the vast collection in the Shizen's library, the first time he tried to enter. A blood seal appeared on the door and glowed a light mint green signifying that while he was a descendant of the clan, which the wolves when they learned about it, had a celebration. Seeing that while he was a member of the clan, since he was the only person who showed up and coincidentally happened to have their blood in him, his connection to the clan was very weak. So he went to Ginasu for advice about entering and the wolf told him to use a gene purging seal that essentially eradicated most of the genes that he got from his father Minato apparently, something that Naruto thought was the only good thing he had ever done right by him. Even if it was just being born a descendant of the Shizen clan, then he had to use a gene strengthening seal to strengthen the Shizen genes in him, and gene purifying seal which he had to use to purify his new genes, and upon doing so he became the new heir of the clan. And as a side effect he gained the auburn highlights in his hair, and the two teal rings in his eyes, and could now enter the library, which ranged from civilian subjects such as mathematics, physics, biology, chemistry, economics, geography, poetry, politics, law, metallurgy, blacksmithing, which after he incorporated the use of a lot of clones he was able to forge his battle claw with some special material, he found that he named Sum no Ginasu, calligraphy which was useful if he wanted to learn Fuenjutsu. Painting, dancing, cooking which he really enjoyed doing so. Sewing, learning to play several instruments such as the violin which he personally thought was his favorite. Gardening which became his favorite hobby, and learning how to forage for edible plants in the wild. As well as being able to use and find ones that promote healing. And studying the anatomy of the human and animal bodies. To shinobi subjects such as Fuenjutsu which he could say he was at an adept level 7 in Uzumaki standards since the art of sealing came easy to him. And although he was incapable at doing them at the moment he also learned Genjutsu. As well as the theory behind it because he had discovered he had the Shizen clan's Dujutsu, that was a mutation that had formed because of the members of several clans that formed together to make up their clan, that they named after themselves called the Shizengen and that as he progressed through the six levels of the first stage, which you could tell what level the Dujutsu was at by the level of brightness the eyes shone which started out as a dull green to a bright neon green. If you want to know what the final level looks like, Look up the new 2015 Fantastic Four Doctor Doom, he found out he could use Genjutsu through eye contact and that the Dujutsu naturally had four unique Genjutsu to it and gained them after he unlocked the Dujutsu's third level while proceeding to the sixth one, so essentially it was one Genjutsu per level. Naruto also learned Irianenjutsu even if he didn't have the control for performing any of the techniques yet. As well as Chakra Theory, Chakra Control, Advanced Bukijutsu. Kenjutsu of which he learned a few styles he was suited for. One of which was Itoryu another was the Shizen's strongest sword style which was passed down to them from the Mibu called the Mumyo Jinpu Ryu Satsujin Ken. But so far had only learned the beginner and intermediate forms of the style. And planned to learn the advanced forms when his body matured some more, which is what Ginasu as well as his tutor said when he had attempted to preform one of the advanced moves of the style only for it to backfire on him and hurt himself which also included learning senjutsu, he also learned some old taijutsu styles that had died out during the clan wars and a few that relied on elemental manipulation, 
that felt right for him bending and was planning to create his own style, but knew he was missing something to create it. He was also surprised to find out that while the Shizen didn't have any Jutsu scrolls, they had an enormous amount of elemental manipulation scrolls, for the five basic elements, and even some sub-elemental manipulation scrolls, a few he didn't even know existed. He was also further surprised to find out that the Shizen were a clan of knowledge seekers, going out and recovering scrolls, books, tomes, and other artifacts to bring back to their compound's library, except for any Jutsu, which made him wonder why. One of the artifacts, was a set of five swords that couldn't be broken, cracked, bent, or dulled that were passed down to the Shizen from the Mibu and one of them was called Tenro. The sword was a Nodashi and was named as it was, because its brightness was just like the real Lupus constellation. It also had a history behind it, about having many warriors striving to obtain the blade, but failed due to its supposed evil nature that one other person had wielded in the past and Naruto had yet to feel its nature. However, one thing was sure, he didn't feel as if he was ready to use it, yet. Even though he got pulled into the sword spirit scape where it had a black sky with a white tree and grass. As well as Tenro's spirit form which took on the appearance of a wolf made out some sort of white energy, and it said it bared the name, Tenro, and that he was its master. So until he was ready to wield the blade, he stored Tenro in one of the three seals on his left forearm which was a storage seal. There were also other interesting things he found, that were either religious, astronomical, or something else, like these weird L-shaped things that the wolves said were weapons called guns, but he didn't see how they were, that would make any shinobi village in the elemental nations go crazy for and cause a war over their existence. Which made him now know why this compound had to be kept a secret. Not just to keep the wolf pack safe, though he really doted it now since they were now like a summoning clan, which he found out they were after trying to naturally summon something, like how the Sanin did, and ended up in front of Ginesu, who gave him the clan's summoning scroll that one of the past Shizen created to sign, as well as a sealing tattoo which was on his right arm underneath the bandages, along with three others but to protect the knowledge from those who would misuse it. Sighing and shaking his head of the memories, he stood and began to follow his two friends to where Ginesu was. Two hours later it took some time to find the pack's ancient king, mostly because the cave he resided in, when not personally overseeing Naruto's training, or going out to hunt these weird red and blue bipedal hybrid lizard bird things for Naruto to eat, which Naruto admitted to himself tasted pretty weirdly as well, was far away, as he was sitting in the same cavern where Naruto first came. You wanted to see me, Gigi, Naruto said to the ancient king who turned to look at the silverette. Why do you ever use that infernal name? You know I don't like it, he said with a slight in the tone of his voice, that had no real malice in it. Naruto scratched the back of his head, while he thought about why he first began to do so, you know what. I have no idea, I kind of forgot why I originally began calling you Gramps in the first place, but I believe it was to make you think that you weren't arrogant, or something like that. He said honestly, the original reason was that he saw the old wolf as a grandfather figure and used the name as a term of endearment while the ancient wolf sighed in resignation, and in the background Rias and Akino snickered in amusement, trying to keep in their laughter. While failing at doing so. Why do I even bother? Janesu thought to himself. Aside from that, I can sense that events are about to happen and that you are integral to them in some way, and need to be in Konoha when they come to pass. Naruto sighed a little at what Janesu said, so. I do have to return. Huh, Naruto said in a voice that sounded between monotone, sadness, and had a tinge of anxiety to it that made him sound older than he looked as he bent his head down, his hair shadowing his face, while his friends Rias and Akano looked at him with concern. Dot dot, I knew I had to return soon, but I don't want to go and wish to stay, here I am at peace, there. I don't know, I don't believe that things have changed there. I still think that the residents will still try to hurt me, that my mother will still neglect me for Natsumi, that. He was cut off as something knocked him down. He looked up and saw that Rias and Akino were pinning him to the ground, and the both were giving him the wolf equivalent of a glare, that they were famous for, which could potentially scare anyone who saw them using it, Naruto however was immune to the glare somewhat, since he had seen something much scarier, Ginesu, when he was using his patented grin. When he first saw it, the grin made him damn near piss himself in fright, and gave him nightmares for weeks. You listen to me, Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze Shizen. Rias growled, 
while the silverette gulped, and also noticed Akano was giving him a frosty glare, Janesu though just had a neutral expression on his face. Me and Akano have known you for 15 years, and now you want to go chicken on us, when you promised to take us out of the forest. Sorry, but I will not settle for that. You trained your butt off ever since you got here, so you could protect yourself from those monsters in human form in Konoha. You also wanted to show that they were wrong to cast you, aside, right? So, grow yourself a pair already, and show them what they missed out on. Naruto was slightly stunned by Rias's words, and felt in his heart that she was right. He should not go and chicken out because of his horrible past, but instead, decided about focusing on the here and now, and worry about it in the future. A ghost of a smile etched itself onto his face as he sat up and gave Rias a hug, which made her give Akino a look saying, he hugged me first, that pissed her off, in where Akino's inner thoughts were along the lines of, Naruto-kun should be hugging me, I'll get you back for this Rias, just you wait until I get my human form foo 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 foo. Thanks, Rias I needed that, Naruto said, then looked at the elder wolf, I will return to Konoha, but first need to get some things from my room. Janesu then gave his trademark grin. Go then, Naruto. Show Konoha that you are no longer defenseless, and what happens when a beast is cornered. The representative of the battle wolf race said, and Naruto nodded sparingly, and hoped that Janesu would stop grinning, before he and his two familiars began walking away, but before they did. Oh and before I forget, come back when you are fifteen or so and if you show enough improvement with your control over your chakra by that time, I'll begin your sage training, while also unlocking a tiny bit of your true power, that I had to suppress. Meanwhile back in Konoha Uzumaki, Namikaze House. All was quiet in the once cheerful and happy residence that was the Uzumaki Namikaze home, but now when you entered it, the house held a faint aura of sadness and despair. Yugo Izuki who had moved into the house, six months after Naruto ran away, because she found her boyfriend at the time Hayate Gekko cheating on her, with another woman, having on the bed in their shared apartment, was currently out on a mission, and Natsumi was at the ninja academy. So, that meant the only person in the house at the moment, was Kashina, who was standing by the closest window facing towards the forest of death, looking outside it in the direction of the infamous forest. With a depressed, solemn look etched onto her haggard face. It had been five long years since her only son left. Out of hurt, her own neglect towards him, sadness, and abuse that was caused by her own inattentiveness to see what the village really was, and the damned civilians and shinobi who had the gull to hurt her son. Also many things had changed during that time, among them was the relationship she had with her daughter. For when Natsumi told her, of what she did the next day. Because of the guilt she was feeling, Kashina had shut down and had collapsed. When she had woke up the next day she wouldn't speak to Natsumi when she came to her and asked how she was doing and continued on her day hurt and ashamed that Natsumi would go behind her back and do this to her brother and continued to do so for three months until one night when they were having dinner time together she said that she was disappointed in what Natsumi had done, and that she wouldn't train her again except for occasionally giving her advice to improve what she already knew until she had graduated from the academy and had been forgiven by Naruto, then became quiet again. And when the news about Naruto running away into the forest of death was leaked to the residents of Konoha, there were many celebrations in most of the bars, restaurants, and stores, as well as the homes of people who wrongfully despised him. Of course, due to the state of a few drunken chunins who particularly liked to talk about anything while drunk, was how Kashina found out how she was not informed nor was she told by her son of his abuse. Apparently the mobs who had beaten him had threatened her son a gruesome death if he ever told her or the Anbu who supposedly protected him, since Yugao had said to her that only she and Hitomi, Femi Tachi, actually took their jobs seriously while trying to protect Naruto, while the rest let the civilians vent their anger out on the unfortunate boy, Kakashi was a part of these, or joined the mob, anything. The civilian council, to whom the Anbu from civilian families owed their true allegiance to, had also helped in keeping this information of her son's abuse a secret, they thought that she didn't know. As a result of this, something in Kashina snapped and she maimed any civilian. Kunoichi, and Shinobi involved in Naruto's torture that she could get her hands on. Personally, with the closest sharp thing she could find which was a guando that made her double take for a second. Since it looked exactly like the one in her nightmare, but wrote it off as a coincidence though she couldn't help but notice it felt right in her hands to use it, so she decided to keep it, she also used her now black spiked chakra chains that felt off to her, 
but decided it wasn't important at the moment, and in a few instances which frightened her a little, green vines that reminded her as well of that nightmare sprouted from the ground and crushed the necks of some civilians. Those who were roughly in one piece and not in the hospital from her rampage were sent to Ibiki and Anko, had fessed up after spending some time with the duo, and were either imprisoned with a life sentence, or executed, depending on what they did and how horrible what they fessed up to was. When the civilian council got wind of this, naturally they tried to have Kashina arrested. So that if she found out what they did, she wouldn't be able to target them. While a few of the male members had ulterior motives for doing so, unfortunately for them she did. But before they could do so Hirazan who had enough, grew a backbone for once, and shot any of their ideas down, and instead ordered her to be put under house arrest for a period of five years, where she could also go into the compound's property, and if she wanted to leave the property then she would be given an escort at all times, while wearing a bracelet that stopped her from using any chakra whatsoever, and that she had to do community service basically D ranks for free during this period of time. The civilian council were put off when they heard this but couldn't do anything about it since Hiruzen still had authority over any kunoichi and shinobi even if they were retired, including the fact that she had a seat on the shinobi council giving her clan head rights that gave her some leeway in certain matters, and didn't kill anyone also severely limited what they could charge her with. So they reluctantly took this as a victory, however small it was. But when Hiruzen revealed a letter addressed to the council that was written from the daimyo himself, they sweated a little, some more than others for doing dealings with shady sources that bordered on illegal, then panicked when the daimyo who apparently heard about what happened from a source suspended the civilian council indefinitely from council meetings and banned them permanently from shinobi affairs, while also ordering a full investigation be done on every member in the near future, to see what else they were hiding from him. And through it all, Kashina had a faint smirk for having one up on them while at the same time most of the shinobi council burst into cheers that they would no longer suffer from a certain pink-haired howler's shrill screams. But that still didn't heal any of the terrible wounds deep inside of Kashina's heart, mind or her soul. Ever since that first nightmare, she kept having them. And in the nightmares, Naruto kept being killed in grisly ways that over the years have gotten worse and more morbid to the point where she developed insomnia and could hardly sleep anymore but did so when her body forced her to. And in each nightmare that she did get, when demonic Kashina, who although still transformed, as time went on demonic Kashina began to stay in her transformed state, into a curvaceous, huge ed wet dream that was a mixture between a one-tailed kitsune, a knockoff of a succubus, a rabbit demon, a devil, and something else which gave off the feeling of emptiness, looked more healthy and less like a burnt walking corpse that had sores which oozed acidic poison each time she had a nightmare, was done with Naruto's desecrated body he would revive right after with those glassed over sky blue eyes and silver slitted pupil dead eyes, demanding or in the odd nightmare pleading why she had abandoned him. Also during each nightmare, she had, she was still captured by those thorn covered vines that held her to the ground, which forced her to watch those torture scenes repeatedly, while cutting into her each time. And when she woke up from them, she noticed that the vine tattoos, that she had found on herself the next morning, while having a shower after the first nightmare, that she also discovered would not come off in any way, that had originated from her right wrist and the bottom of her left leg would grow a little, currently the one on her left leg was halfway up to her knee, while the one on her right wrist, had extended to the middle of her forearm. Warning. This next segment contains graphic scenes, if you were under the age of 16 please skip this segment. And after one of the terrible nightmares, when demonic Kashina had tortured her son like usual, and while being a rarity, it was not out of place in her nightmares, she did something different. For after plunging the guando into Naruto's throat, demonic Kashina took the guando out and began to take her clothes off as well as Naruto's. Then she proceeded to have with his corpse, the sight in front of Kashina disgusted her to no end. But it also slightly turned her on. Demonic Kashina seeing this looked at her and then smirked. As she surprised Kashina by walking over to her and ripped off the clothes she was wearing, while presenting her to her son's body, which had now gotten up from the ground and walked over to the two, it then developed a cruel smirk on its face and with a surprising strength that she didn't know it had, it grabbed her by her shoulders, and then raped her multiple times, and to her shame she secretly enjoyed every second what it was doing to her. When she woke up, she had been so ashamed of herself that she attempted suicide, only to be stopped by her best friend, Makoto Uchiha. 
She was then placed on suicide watch for a year and a half, and during that time she attempted it four more times before she had straightened up with help from her best friend, Yugo, and her daughter, which although they wouldn't have that close mother-daughter relationship again, like they had before Naruto ran away, Kashina had recently began speaking to her more openly. For those of you who are 15 or so and younger, you can read now, unless you disregarded the warning, then in that case disregard this captioned sentence. A few tears leaked from her eyes, as she thought about the child she had so foolishly neglected and left in the shadows where he was abused and experienced a life worse than hell. And even though, Yugo had told her and Natsumi that he didn't hate them, deep down Kashina knew that Naruto would most likely never trust the both of them again, especially her, if he ever came back that is. She had also spent a lot of time in her beloved son's room, by expanding the size of it with expansion seals till the room was twice the size of the master bedroom, then either making sure that it then stayed clean for when or if he came home, or would cry on the bed. Naruto Sochi. She thought to herself, I'm such an awful mother. She then heard a knock on the door which made her come out of reliving her memories. I'll be with you in a minute, she said softly, but loud enough for the person on the other side of the door to hear her as she wiped the tears from her eyes. When she opened the door, she gave a small smile as on the other side was Makoto Uchiha, her best friend from her genin days. Makoto-chan, it's great to see you again, how are you today? She said quietly, as the Uchiha matriarch and clan head smiled back at the woman who she'd known for years. Now how is it that Makoto was alive, when she should have died with the rest of the Uchiha? Well, on the night of the Uchiha clan massacre by Hitomi, by the orders of the elders, and Hiruzen, she went to visit Kashina when the Uzumaki attempted suicide for the first time, and took her to the hospital. And because of that, some divine providence from some higher being, smiled at her and she was spared the fate the rest of the clan suffered. Now only she and Sasuke were the only Uchiha left in Konoha, and was trying to raise him, but it was proving difficult and depressing, as he had changed from the boy who wished for his father's approval and was kind to her to a revenge-obsessed teen with an elite complex that was being pampered by the civilians and the elders. She was also saddened that he would never speak to her anymore, and only grunted to her in passing or on occasion demand food when he was hungry. Makoto gave Kashina a slight smile in return, but could see Kashina's smile didn't reach her eyes, and she knew why. Good afternoon Kashina, I just came over to see how you were holding up she said, and watched as Kashina unconsciously rubbed her wrists from her last attempt at committing suicide. I've been approving Makoto-chan, really. I'm not planning on doing anything to off myself anytime soon. Kashina said in an attempt to humor Makoto, who sighed and frowned slightly. Kashina. Said Uzumaki gave a slight chuckle nervously as she scratched the back of her head, knowing nothing escaped her best friend. Makoto shook her head. She knew Naruto running away had affected Konoha as a whole whether it was for good or bad, she probably wouldn't know, but what she did know was how hard Kashina was affected by his act, and was becoming more desperate by the day to see him again. He will come back, Kashina. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but I feel deep down that he will come from wherever he is soon, I promise you that. She said, while Kashina sighed as she led her friend to the living room of the house. I wish I was more confident about that. The depressed Uzumaki mother trailed off, then said, but how would I know that he doesn't hate me for my past in his misery? Unknown location, soon Kushi Chan. Very soon the both of us will meet officially, and your worst nightmares will begin, for the ones I made you experience until now were only pleasant dreams compared to what I am going to do to you. Then I'll be together with my Naru Chan, and you. Muahahaha. Hokage Monument. Well, here we are finally here in this village for the foreseeable future. Naruto said in a cold voice that was slightly monotone as he stood on the Nadaim's head looking over the very place he left which to everyone else but him was five years ago. Hmm, in my opinion I would say that Konoha definitely hasn't changed much but has gotten worse. My husband, said Thea, who had reached her peak of twelve tales not too long ago and for some reason had taken to calling Naruto her husband when she discovered her human, and her beast forms who was also looking at the village through Naruto's eyes. So this is Konoha that husband is from, for this one time I'm going to have to agree with you. Thea, said a second unknown really sensual feminine voice, which spoke up suddenly inside Naruto's mind. Hey, I was here first and only I can call Naruto-kun husband, you darkness. As if, 
Naruto-kun ed me first, which makes me able to call him that. Wolf. You forced yourself on him. You know good rotten, cunt. So what? He didn't struggle. If anything he enjoyed it just as much as I did, whore. Shut up. You big ed cow. Make me, panty flasher. That's it. I have had enough of you rog. Shouted Thea, at the unknown voice as the two then began to fight within Naruto's mind, which he chose to make his connection to them fade away into the back of his mind, for the time being. While rubbing his forehead since the two were causing him to get a headache. As he was doing so, Rias and Akino appeared beside him, so Naruto-kun, you ready to make those, people, taste the dust from your shoes. Said Rias. Of course he will Rias-chan. Ooh, I just can't wait for him to make some of those, people, see the error of their ways and to, help, them understand their folly, foo 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 foo. Answered Akino. You're right, Akino I forgot about his grudge. Anyway I wonder if we will see that girl Naruto talked about seeing, you know that pale-eyed one who lost her father because of some affair her clan experienced some years ago or something like that. Rias added, who was mentally smirking at the fact that she saw Naruto's face having a slight tinge of red to it. But also made a note to herself to find this girl and show her who Naruto's, Alpha, was, while also showing the girl her place. Very funny. Rias, the silver-haired avatar groaned out as he heard the two battle wolves snickering, as he looked at the Hokage tower below him. He gave a hollow sigh, knowing he was going to face one of the two people who were the cause of his past torment and misery and be asked a lot of questions about how he survived in the forest for so long. He then turned to the two and said a few words, which meant more than what they meant. Let's go meet an old man. Hokage office. Hiruzen Serutobi sighed as he read another document that needed to be signed. Although the paperwork had dwindled down a lot since the fire daimyo banned the civilian council from attending any, if not all council meetings, and had rooted out several of them for pilfering funds from his coffers. Among their numerous other crimes, among those who were caught was a certain pink-haired woman. However she got away with it scot-free because of some bribes she made as well as doing something that made several slightly corrupt officials who she gathered around her at the same time. Really happy and content, there was still plenty of the stuff to go around especially since the civilian council still held control over the economy, which unfortunately included the ninja academy, however he did manage to do one thing about the place while he still had some say in it, which was that he increased the graduating age from 12 to 15 so that the graduates would be a bit more prepared after they graduate from it, and enter the real world. How Minato made this look easy, I'll never know. He said to himself, as he sighed then thought about the past. It had been a grueling five years for Hiruzen since Naruto ran away from his home, and into training ground 44, or as it was known to many, the forest of death. He had been sending search parties in there to find the boy but they all came back exhausted, banged up, and empty-handed. Then there was Kashina's first attempt at suicide, which was thankfully prevented by Makoto who survived the Uchiha massacre due to her being at the hospital at the time when he had her daughter kill everyone to stop her husband's coup attempt. After that there was the reports from Jiraiya saying something about Orochimaru taking over rice country, and building his own ninja village, which wasn't a good sign, and there was a small side note about some organization that Jiraiya had heard about who were called Akatsuki or something along those lines. He sighed, as he rubbed the bridge of his nose. Things were getting more hectic with each year, and made a note to himself to find a new successor soon. His thoughts were interrupted as he heard a commotion outside of the door. Young man, I told you. The Hokage is very busy right now. And I also told you that pets weren't allowed inside the building either. He winced as his secretary shouted, making him wonder if she was related to a certain pink-haired woman who was the chairwoman of the civilian council, followed by a voice-cold voice that was slightly raised, that he could hear clearly. For the last time, I don't care what you think, or say, you flat-chested excuse of a woman. And these girls are not my pets, they are my familiars. Besides I don't see you complaining whenever about the Inazuka bringing their Ninkan in here. That's because they are an exception. And what do you mean by flat-chested you rotten punk? My chest is a high C-cup. Ah, call them off. Call them off. My arm. Let go of my arm you mutt. Hiruzen blinked at that as he heard his secretary's screams as well as if he heard right, her confession of her size, and the sounds of a scuffle and growling outside the door. 
Release the Sekar O off. Damn ga ah. The door slammed open as the body of a Chunin flew through it, and embedded itself into the wall behind Hirazan, where said Chunin groaned in pain, prompting Hirazan and his Anbu guards to jump into different Taijutsu stances. They looked at the individuals who had caused the disturbance, as they entered the room. As Hirazan was sizing them up, the one in the middle caught his attention for it was a boy who looked to be around his mid-teens based on his height and body size. But the most striking thing about him was that there were three vertical scares that were underneath his left eye that extended to his left ear and three thin whisker marks on each cheek, as well as his mostly silver hair. Which he knew only one person had. You sure got an older, old man. Hirazan and the Anbu couldn't help but gape like fish as Hirazan stammered out his, guests, name. Silence. It is paradise for some and torture to others, and can both last for an eternity or shortly be killed with the softest of whispers. For in one moment, all was silent in the Hokage's office, not even the secretaries. Lucky, cricket she got from her superstitious mother that she named Jiminai, hypocritical much outside the office on her desk was chirping. Hirazan couldn't believe what was in front of his eyes, the very boy whom he had just been thinking about was standing, not fifteen feet away, right in front of him along with two large wolves standing on either side of him. He also saw that despite living in such a dangerous place, Naruto had grown well and had the look of a professional shinobi about him, which was easy to tell just by looking at how fit and muscular he became, though Hiruzen was saddened by the fact that Naruto seemed to have lost an eye in that forest, judging by the fact that there was an eye patch that was over where his right eye should have been. Though it was odd that there was the kanji for suppression on it, but Hiruzen shrugged since he thought that Naruto had it for fashion purposes. He then looked at the boys. Lone, I and saw nothing but cold indifference, that showed no happiness, joy, anger, resentment, sadness, fear, or even pain, but he inwardly winced when he thought that pain was a better alternative to the cold indifferent expression in Naruto's eye. But the small frown that graced Naruto's face, along with the indifferent expression in his eye at least made Hiruzen somewhat relieved that he wasn't abducted by Danzo and turned into an emotionless child drone. Naruto. The old cage began to say, only for him to be cut off. If you are thinking that this is some type of a reunion of sorts, don't even bother, for I am only here to say that I wish to sign up for the academy, nothing more. Naruto said in a cold voice, not wanting to be in Hiruzen's presence for any amount of time longer than what was necessary. He didn't want to be anywhere near the man who felt that the civilians and shinobi were somewhat justified to use him as some sort of personal punching bag to relieve their anger and frustration out on. Hiruzen was silent for a few moments, Naruto's interruption shocking him greatly, before he managed to find his voice. Why? Why yes. But, Naruto, what happened to you in the forest, and, can you tell me why there are wolves following you? He said motioning to Rias and Akino who were giving the Hokage and his personal Anbu slight glares, making the people on the receiving end, feeling a bit nervous, and the slightest bit uncomfortable. Naruto then closed his eye, and looked to be in deep concentration before he opened his eye and spoke, um, let me see. Dot dot, I hope I don't appear to come off as rude and all that, but I am sorry to say, that I'm going to have to tell you that I am disinclined to acquiesce to your request. Naruto said, causing everyone in the office besides him and his battle wolf familiars to gain a look of confusion, until he said, means, no. Causing Hiruzen to frown a little and the Anbu to become tense slightly. Not caring that he refused the Hokage's question demand, Naruto then continued, after all Hokage dono, it's not as if telling some secrets could cause harm to anyone. What with them being? harmless, and all that, which caused Hiruzen to flinch and recoil as if he was hit by something, while getting a saddened look on his face. W well, then, would you consider moving back into your home, at least? Hiruzen asked, hoping that Naruto would go back to his family's house. And saw that Naruto was thinking again before he replied. To answer your question Hokage Dono, I think. If I were to put this situation into perspective of our current society, and see that since I have not yet attended the Ninja Academy, nor have I graduated from said place and received a forehead protector making be by law an adult, that means I'll have to go back there, since technically I am still classified as a child. Dot dot quote. Naruto said, as he placed his hand on Akino's head. 
which made Hiruzen inwardly sigh in relief at that, but then Naruto continued speaking, however, if Kashina for any reason won't allow my friends to stay in the house, then I will seek an apartment to live in, or a plot of land to buy and build my own house on it. Hiruzen sighed at Naruto's condition to moving back, and saw that the two wolves had faces which looked like they would try to dare Kashina to say no, but he eventually nodded anyway. Fine. If Kashina won't allow the two wolves, I will help you find accommodations. And before you meet them, I should tell you beforehand that you might not recognize them at first, for your departure was hard on both your mother and sister, he said, and saw that Naruto didn't even flinch or react at the news concerning his family. However, unknown to Hiruzen at that moment, Naruto was indeed thinking about what the old cage had just said. So, they finally realize that I actually exist and now they acknowledge the fact that I do matter to them. Sigh, still that doesn't mean I will just forgive or forget what they have done to me so easily, he thought, as Thea spoke up. You know husband, if you had left a note, I bet that they wouldn't have taken you leaving so hard. Thea said, only to be rebuked by the second voice. No, they would have felt even worse if he did, husband was in the right to do what he did. The voice retorted which made Thea get really irritated. No you're wrong, you whore. If he would have left a note, they probably would not have automatically assumed the worst case scenario possible. And I already told you skank, do not to call my Naruto-kun, your husband. I am his real wife. Not you, you tie concubine charlatan. Thea shouted at the owner of the second voice, who retaliated to Thea's shouting at her, by flipping the bird at her, which enraged Thea, and once again they started to fight, and just like last time, Naruto drowned them out again. And upon seeing that Naruto wasn't going to speak again, Hiruzen opened a desk drawer and brought out a piece of paper and began to write into it. This letter will let you into class 201A. Give it to instructor Aruka Yumino, he's a good person. I will also let you know ahead of time that this class has the clan heirs in it, including your sister. Naruto nodded as he then approached the desk and accepted the letter from Hiruzen, which was after the old cage had wrote something down on it, and then placed the Hokage seal on it, which he then gave the letter to Naruto, who had then proceeded to walk out of the room, with the two wolves following behind him. Hiruzen then let out a sigh, that he didn't know he was holding as he looked at the now unconscious Chunin still embedded in the wall, as well as the door that was on the floor. Someone please get him and whoever else was outside, along with Hanako, the secretary, to the hospital, and have a repairman to fix the door. He ordered and the Anbu nodded, and one of them went to the embedded Chunin and got him out, after struggling to do so for about 10 minutes, while the others went out of the office and gathered up Hanako who had fainted while Naruto and him were talking, and the other Chunin who was knocked out, then headed to the hospital. After they were gone Hiruzen went back to doing the paperwork, but stopped, for during the time his eyes were off of it, the paperwork magically quadrupled. Making the old cage think to himself, how the hell, did this get here? And then, after thinking for a few seconds, I curse you Minato, for taking the secret of defeating this monstrosity called paperwork to your grave. He thought, while beginning to break down and cry. Ninja Academy, Classroom 201A. The Academy, one of the largest buildings in Kanahagakur and located directly at the base of the Hokage Mountain. It was for decades, and still is the place where prospective ninja are trained to become genin, and where official ninja receive their assignments from the Hokage's office, which is also located in the academy. And was also founded by Toborama Senju the Nadaim Hokage out of military necessity, to produce shinobi for the first shinobi world war. Now inside the academy, is a classroom, 201A, now it wasn't different than any of the other rooms on the first and second levels which were large and had high ceilings that were made that way, based on the theory that larger classrooms lead to expansive education, which carried over to the blackboard itself, for some reason. And placed in front of the blackboard was a podium, situated far from the students' desks and put in a position where the teacher could view everyone. But what separated this particular room from the others, was that the famous shinobi of Konoha such as the Sanin, Kakashi Hataki, Asuma Serutobi, other less known shinobi, and even the famous Yandaimi Minato Namikaze all graduated from it. And this generation's shinobi hopefuls, were inside the class. Including the clan heirs, which consisted of, Shino Abarame, Shikamaru Nara, Choji Akamichi, Kiba Inazuka, Hanada Hayuga, 
Ino Yamanaka, Sakura Haruno who despite not being a clan heir, was the daughter of Mebuki Haruno the head of the civilian council which was unfortunately for Hiruzen and the shinobi council still around, Sasuke Uchiha dubbed the last Uchiha by the civilians and elders of the village, even though his mother Makoto was still alive. As for what the clan heirs and Sakura are wearing, just imagine pre Shippuden clothes on Shino, Kiba, Hanada, Ino, Shikamaru, Choji, Sakura, and Sasuke, lastly in the back left corner which was mostly abandoned since the other kids didn't want anything to do with her, was Natsumi Uzumaki Namikaze the Namikaze clan heiress, the friendless class loner and current dead last due to being ostracized by everyone which included her one-time friends in the class due to certain events that happened over the five years that Naruto had ran away. She was currently the tallest student in the class standing around 5 feet 4 inches, and her hair reached between her shoulder blades and was tied into a low ponytail, with two bangs hanging down both sides of her face. She was wearing a burnt orange, kimono-style blouse, held closed by a broad black obi that matched her black mini shorts and black thigh-high tights. Her blouse was deliberately closed quite low, revealing her sizable cleavage of her mid-D cup S that she had got due to getting an early form of puberty, she also beat by two sizes a certain Hayuga who had high CCs by also having an early form of puberty, and whom was rather jealous of Natsumi for having a larger chest than her. Which Natsumi was proud of, and wore her blouse that way due to her mindset of wanting to be a real kunoichi and use her natural looks as a distraction to use against shinobi, and other kunoichi. She also wore open-toed, Kunoichi high-heeled sandals, and had a pair of clear goggles, the wraparound ones that Konami Tosin wears, that had seals applied on them so that they wouldn't fall off her face once she put them on and used a minuscule amount of nature chakra to make them stick as well as a specially crafted Zatoichi sword that she used as a cane, due to the fact that she was now blind, due to an event that happened two years previously. And in front of the closed door of classroom 201A was none other than Naruto, who had his hand on the knob debating to himself whether to go in or not. Sighing to himself, he felt as if hours passed by so that he could come up with a decision, but in reality it was only a few seconds, and his decision was to open the door, so he turned the knob and with Rias and Akino following, he walked in. Flashback a few minutes ago. Five years. It had been five long years, since that one day, that one horrible day where everything in Natsumi Uzumaki Namikaze's world had changed. And the first sign of that change, was the following second day after the first day where she had cried her heart out, because she had learned that her Oni-chan had run away from Konoha to the forest of death because he had been neglected and felt unloved, and unwanted while also being abused by the villagers, which she had unintentionally been a part of. By pulling pranks, vandalizing private property, to even stealing from various people with her friends or kids she hung out with and using him as a scapegoat to not get into any trouble. Where when she told anyone who came up to them and asked who was responsible, she just pointed out her brother, then the person asking them would get a sudden gleam in their eyes and thanked her before sending her and whoever she hung out with on their way, but not before hearing that her bother would get what was coming to him. Which now that she looked back on the times she said that he was responsible and heard that phrase, she would often wish she could go back in time and strangle her younger self. And on that second day, out of guilt that was tearing her heart apart from the inside, she told her mother everything that she had ever done to her Oni-chan. Which ranged from the unintentional abuse she gave him, by using him as a scapegoat so that the civilians would have an excuse to beat him even though she didn't know that, to telling him a few times that their mother loved her more than him, and lastly that she had banned any child their age from befriending him, so that she could have all of his attention for herself. When she had finished telling her mother what she had done, Kashina had collapsed, but as she did so, Natsumi swore that for a second she saw nothing but pure hate in her mother's eyes that looked like two glowing red orbs in black pools, which from that night onward still continued to give her nightmares, before returning to their purple color. So not knowing what else to do at the moment, she with the help of a few shadow clones, put her mother in her bed and ordered one to stay in the room to notify her of any changes in her mother's condition. Then spent most of the day in her room, where she came up with two more ideas for the new taijutsu style she was coming up with, where for the first idea she had to increase her strength and speed to the point that she could send out a compressed air blade by kicking that she called taifukaku, or use a variation with her arms that could potentially send out air blasts and had come up with the name taifiatsu for the technique. While for the other idea, 
which she based off of the fundamentals of the first idea of the taijutsu style she was creating that she had dubbed kiru, was that she had to kick the air hard enough to jump off of it, where she could stay in the air for much longer than usual which she called Tengoku Uruku. When she woke up the next day, after experiencing her first nightmare about her mother having those red and black eyes. Her clone who had been in her mother's room the whole time popped, giving her the memories of her mother about to awaken, when she got to her mother's room, and asked her mother when she woke up how she was doing, Kashina wouldn't answer her except with only a blank stare that made her want to crawl under a rock, and that blank stare which also haunted her dreams, even if she didn't know it yet, was the first sign that her world changed. Flashback and inside classroom 201A Natsumi Pav. Currently the Namikaze heiress was listening with a bored expression to her class Chunin instructor Uruka Amino drone endlessly on about the history of Konoha, which she had heard about ten different times, for this month alone. Sure, it was informative and very interesting for her to hear about the history of her home that she grew up in, the first time that Uruka had lectured about the subject. And somewhat nice to hear the history of her village the second and third times that Uruka had talked about it. But as time went on, Aruka had for some reason began to speak really long lectures about the subject. And she became less interested in it, until she liked the rest of the class. With the exception of a certain flat-chested, pink-haired howler monkey fangirl, who at the moment almost every part of her being was thinking about doing something cough-raping cough the resident duck butt-haired, last, Uchiha in Konoha although his mother Makoto was still alive and living in the village. Though that meant nothing because the civilian council, along with the elders had constantly pampered him, giving him a spoiled rotten attitude. That coupled with his massive arrogance, elite complex that was staring to develop. And his mindset of an avenger which developed because his sister who he was thinking about how to kill currently, had massacred the Uchiha, when in reality she only went after the men in Uchiha elders plotting to overthrow Konoha. While a certain masked man went after the rest, except for a few that were targeted by certain blank masked Anbu and had their eyes taken. Also in a very small part of his mind, he was thinking about the third legs of the male species he was a part of that he saw when he went to the hot springs the other day, and was fascinated by them, bored to the point, that they were on the verge of falling asleep, also it didn't help that Aruka was a person who spoke in a tone of voice that made the lectures he was saying b-o-r-i-n-g, boring. She felt like, she was at the point where she was about to rip her blonde hair out of her own head in frustration if she continued to listen to Uruka's long-winded lecture. Please Kami-sama, help me. Please give me a distraction so that I don't have to listen to this torture, she thought, and just at that moment, while Natsumi was inwardly praying the doorknob turned, followed by the door to classroom 201A opening, making Uruka stop his lecture, and turn his head in befuddlement towards the door, then go over to it. Thank you. She shouted with joy as well as crying anime tears of happiness in her mind, however she became shocked, and her bored expression from the lecture turned to surprise, as she used her sensing ability that she was trying to hone to the point where she could see everything in various shades of blue, IB4. Huluim show underscore key underscore art, 25,894, size equals 1,600 by 600 in region equals US, only without the colored woman and words with the NBC logo, with pinpoint, clarity. That she was training her ability to try and use it. On a subconscious level where she could use as a form of sight, and at this point she could see everything in a 35-foot radius around her with good clarity and fine detail while the rest of her range which was up to 6.5 kilometers at this point was somewhat blurry and could only use it even with her large chakra reserves for only about 11 hours a day since the technique drained her at a moderately fast rate that she could control when to use it and when to turn it off. Which had evolved due to the event which caused her to become blind to sense chakra that had merged with her negative empathy sensing creating something that was almost like a basic version of the mind's eye of the Kagura technique that some members of her clan used in the past, to see, and sense the person on the other side of the door enter, and then her expression began to morph into shock. Oh, Oni-chan. She couldn't believe what her own sensing ability was, seeing, and sensing for her as she could feel the familiar emotions, as well as the extremely potent chakra reserves, that she felt were huge, and were about quadruple that of her own, but something deep inside of her, made her believe the reserves were a lot larger than they appeared, of her own brother, Naruto. Even though it had been five years, and because of a certain, event, 
that happened to make her blind where she had been depressed for weeks afterwards since she would never be able to see with her eyes again, she still remembered the familiar emotions, including the presence of him. She also recognized the three scars underneath his left eye, though he was taller than when she had last seen him and a lot more muscular and beautiful which made her blush which deepened when she smelt a certain odor coming from him. A salty musk reminiscent of dry juniper, cedar, and pine wood, oiled leather, and smoke, though she was saddened that he apparently only had one eye judging by the eye patch he had over his right eye. However, she became confused as she saw, through her sensing ability what she thought were two large dogs that looked like they had manes, enter behind him. Naruto Pav, excuse me, but this is classroom 201A, right? Because I was told to come here, to this classroom, also are you Chunin instructor Uruka Yumino? Naruto asked, and said Chunin who had a horizontal scar on his nose, blinked in confusion. Uh, yes, that's right. Uruka said, how can I help you? He asked, wondering who the teen with the cold voice was, even though something about the boy made him think, he saw the boy before. Naruto then walked up to the academy instructor and handed him the letter that Hiruzen gave him. Uruka opened it, and read the contents before his eyes widened, and his face went through several different expressions, and one of the expressions among them was anger, before Uruka's face settled on neutrality, that supported a very small smile that was strained. Well Naruto-san, I must say welcome back from your training. He said, while the silverette just shrugged at Uruka's gesture at trying to be friendly at him. Now, if you would take a seat next to, let's see. Uruka paused as he looked around the room and saw a bunch of seats open around Natsumi his sister which was somewhat of a shock to Uruka as well as one vacant by the Hyuga heiress, Hanada and then continued, Ah. You can sit next to Natsumi if you want, or Hanada if you wish to. Said girl, after hearing her name, began to blush, then turned a darker shade of red. When Naruto looked in her direction for a brief moment but became sad when Naruto looked away from her and began walking in the direction of where she was sitting. Which made her angry, and in her mind the Hyuga heiress promised to herself to make sure that she would stop, her the lying Kyubi spawn, from making friends with the new boy, who in her own opinion was really beautiful, and hot, who greatly reminded her of the lying Kyubi spawn's brother that she still had a massive crush on, though admittedly she was a little ashamed that she allowed the Kyubi spawn to drag her into using her crush as a scapegoat that the lying Kyubi spawn drove away. All the while, watching this from Natsumi's seal was the Kyubi, also known as Kurama, though no one but her fellow Biju knew that. Her eyes then narrowed behind the cage as she sensed something from the silverette, and smelled an odd scent. He smells like the forest wolves, something alien to me, as well as something similar to myself, and something else a certain odor coming from him, a salty musk reminiscent of dry juniper, cedar, and pine wood, oiled leather, and smoke which smells really pleasant, and his chakra feels partly similar to my own, but at the same time it's different. What is this? She thought and just when the silverette passed bit Natsumi. An image assaulted her mind briefly which was that of a wolf-like creature with only a single tail, fourteen whiskers, and sky-blue eyes that had silver-slitted pupils was staring back at her, along with another creature hidden in the first one's shadow that she could only see an outline of, which reminded her of some sort of creature that reminded her of a spider, since it had eight limbs that had some sort of mask, with a crown on it. As soon as the image showed itself, it then vanished, leaving the vixen shocked, as she gasped in surprise. W. What was that? She said, completely taken off guard by what she witnessed. Outside the seal, Natsumi suddenly shivered as she felt the seal on her stomach turn cold all of a sudden and placed a hand on it. W what is going on? She thought. It appears that the fox, or should I say vixen sensed the wolf in her. A cold voice, suddenly said. Natsumi tilted her head and looked up in the direction where she saw her brother looking at her with a cold indifferent expression and heard the direction he spoke from which made her inwardly cringe when she saw his face, though she also slightly blushed as his eye passed over her body and paused while at looking at the direction of where her useless eyes were for a second. The words he had also just said had confused her, and she wondered what he meant by that. But before she could ask, Naruto continued on his trek with the two large dogs, 
following him where he paused and looked at the desk beside hers with a strange expression on his face. He then shrugged and sat down at the middle of the bench belonging to the desk, with the large dogs following suit. Normal Pav. And watching him was a boy with wild spiky dark brown hair covered by a hood with a puppy in it, with slitted eyes, fang-shaped tattoos, and feral features about him. This was Kiba Inazuka the second heir of the Inazuka clan. He had taken one sniff at the silverette, and felt in his bones that he was a threat to his, alpha male, status. And the two wolves accompanying the silverette, which he smelt what they really were, made him feel on edge. But despite this, he had seen the way the Hyuga heiress Hinata had looked at the new kid, and was jealous of him, and promised to himself to show the new kid his place so that she would see that he was the true alpha, and show an interest in him. Kiba wasn't the only one who was watching the silverette. As Sasuke Uchiha, the last heir of the Uchiha clan, until he passed on his white DNA to at least one woman of which there was no shortage of fangirls and had a child. Though that seemed unlikely as he was beginning to show a preference in men, was also watching the silverette with rapt attention, and while he felt uneasy by the aura of power that the silverette was giving off subconsciously, he was also jealous of the silverette having that power and wanted it for himself, he also felt something else, and although the feeling of a part of himself getting hard was foreign to him, it felt good. Another clan heir, Shikamaru Nara, had a bored look on his face, but he was in fact actually studying the new student. He wasn't the only one as the Abarame heir, Shino, was also studying the runaway Uzumaki, who at moment was gazing at the student body with an indifferent expression, and came to the conclusion that most of them were weak, and decided they weren't cut out for being a shinobi. Choji the heir of the Akamichi just opened a bag of chips he got out of nowhere and began to eat them. But on the inside was wondering if the silverette was friendly, and in another part of the class Ino Yamanaka who was arguing with Sakura about something to do with Sasuke took one look at the silverette and stopped suddenly, and began to slightly drool at the sight of the silver-haired Adonis, and decided that Sakura could have Sasuke to herself, as she would get that glorious hunk of a male specimen for herself. Thus the Naruto fan club was born, which made Naruto shiver slightly and feel as if something somewhat good or bad depending on the situation was about to happen in the future. Sakura on the other hand took one look at the new boy, and just thought that he was trying to steal Sasuke's spotlight, deluded much, and saw that Ino wasn't paying attention to herself, and decided that Ino could have the dobi, that she newly christened Naruto, which made her happy that she could have Sasuke to herself. Okay everyone, Uruka said, now I know that this is rather sudden, but the Hokage has assigned a new student to this class. He has been, for the last few years now know a training trip with a Tokubetsu Janin, so, why don't you stand up and introduce yourself? Naruto then sighed in response, at how Uruka put the figurative spotlight on him even though he already had it when he walked into the classroom, since the whole class individual attention was on him, he then stood up, and began to speak in a cold voice. Some of you may have heard of, or remember me, but for those of you who don't know of me, I am Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze. He said, then saw the reactions he had expected to get from revealing his name to the children of those who had tortured him in his youth. As most of the boys began to stare at him with either anger, some sort of mixture between envy and jealousy, or hatred in their eyes, along with almost half of the girls, Sasuke's fan club that was reduced to half of its size, which included Sasuke Uchiha. Kiba Inazuka, and Sakura Haruno though when Naruto entered the classroom, and had walked past her to his seat, he had felt that there was something strange about her, and made a mental note to examine this curiosity of his at a later date. He then saw that the rest of the boys and a few of the girls had neutral looks on their faces. These were orphan children of Shinobi and Kunoichi who had died in the Kyubi attack. That just thought that he was a new arrival, but were curious about him. Included in this category of kids were Shikamaru Nara, Shino Abarame, and Choji Akamichi, while the leftover group of children consisted of the other girls they were the stronger, prettier, and smarter girls that used to be part of the Sasuke fan club, but saw the new kid and subconsciously jumped ship for the new hottie who weren't part of the neutral group. Among this group were Ino Yamanaka, and Hinata Hayuga who were surprised, though the surprised look that they had on their faces turned to them gaining a pained and ashamed look on their faces, before the looks on their faces changed again, and for Ino it was replaced with her and the girls of the third group gaining blushes as well as hearts in their eyes, while a few of them began to drool. 
making his left eye twitch, as he saw that a fan club for him was beginning to develop. As for Hanada, the pained and ashamed look she briefly had, changed to a look that she gave him that was filled with lust. It weirded him out, and caused him to inwardly shudder a little with disgust at seeing that look on a 12-year-old girl, who also happened to be the shortest kid in the class standing at 4 feet 7 inches. While Natsumi was different than what he had expected, as she was subdued, and had several emotions on her face with the most prevalent being sadness. He then wondered why she was different, but decided after a moment to continue on with his introduction. I have very few likes, and among them are training, my friends Rias, and Akino here, gardening, as well as meditating. I dislike hypocrites of any kind, rapists, liars, people who commit public acts of vandalism and get away from it, as well as people who frame me for no reason other than to escape punishment, as well as a few other things. Also my dream is to be the strongest shinobi in the world, and to surpass someone who I consider precious as they were like a grandfather to me. And to show a few people what they could have had, if they hadn't thought of casting me aside for temporary fame and false friends. Natsumi, Ino, and Hinata winced at Naruto's introduction, hearing about how he disliked liars, and vandalists, felt like a slap in the face for Ino and Hinata, since those words brought up memories of times they had done questionable things with her as children, where she had dared to call them her best friends. But for Natsumi it felt like a stab to the heart, which made her heart feel worse since Naruto mentioned that he had also disliked people who had framed him. And when Naruto said the second part of his dream, she was almost in tears, as what he said made her relive every memory, she had of her childhood, and desperately wished that she could turn back time, and stangle her younger self, for causing her only chan so much pain, even if she had only unintentionally, caused him to have so much torture during their childhood. That to the current moment she still fully blamed herself for. Uruka nodded at that, while faintly giving a smile, and was about to speak up when Naruto cut him off, by finishing his introduction. Also, I will let you know beforehand that I am not interested in making friends at the moment, with any of you, for I know that the only thing some among you are capable of doing right, is to stab someone else in the back, even if it meant you were seen in a positive light by everyone else. That you thought were close to you. Naruto trailed off as he had seen some of the kids, which included a few of the clan heirs flinch, which made him mentally note that these kids were the ones that he could rely on the most if he was teamed up with them on a mission, since they seemed to have some sense of morality about them. Then he spoke up, and lastly, to finish my introduction. I would like to say that for those of you who have wronged me in any way, I am willing to forgive you, but for me to do so, you must be able to earn my trust and some form of my respect beforehand, so that I can know that your motives for wanting me to forgive you are pure. Naruto said, and noticed he had left the whole room spellbound, and had also noticed that some of the kids who had flinched gained thoughtful expressions in their faces for a brief moment, then noticed that Natsumi, even though she tried to hide it, had a hopeful expression on her face, as she, looked, in his direction, at him. Well, that was, thank you, Naruto for sharing that with us. Uruka said, after he mostly regained his composure, you can sit down now. Naruto nodded, then sat back down, as Uruka continued with his lecture. A few hours later, the rest of the school day went by really slowly in Naruto's opinion, as the students began to leave the academy. He and his familiars were heading for the gate, and were almost at it after getting away from his new fan club and narrowly escaping a hormonally-driven Hyuga who experienced puberty early, when a gruff voice got his attention. Hey, Naruto turned, and there stood the second heir of the Inazuka clan, giving him a death glare, though it was quite amusing to him as the kid was almost a foot shorter, and whatever image he was going for, was kind of ruined because he had to stare up at Naruto's face. Deciding to humor the Inazuka, since he provided him some amusement, and that she taught him to be polite when meeting someone for the first time, and by taught, Naruto meant he had the manners to be courteous when meeting other people for the first time, pounded into him, Naruto asked, what can I do for you? And Kiba's glare, if it could got more intense, which only made what the Inazuka was doing a lot more amusing to Naruto. Stay away from Hanada, Kiba growled out, and the silverette's left eyebrow rose at that. May I inquire as to why? Naruto asked, and saw that the Inazuka's face became red with anger at that, he was also quite confused about why the Inazuka told him to stay away from Hanada as he was pretty sure, 
he didn't want to be anywhere near the mostly obsessed Hyuga. Just shut up and stay away from her, wolf boy. Hiba shouted, and attempted to march up to Naruto and hit him, but stopped and paled as the two, large, wolves began to bristle and growl at him. Though what was strange about this, was that Kiba's face didn't pale because of the wolves, no he paled in fear because of the intense stare that Naruto was giving him, and the image of a giant hybrid between a wolf and a dragon which was larger than the Kyubi was staring at him for a few seconds before vanishing. I wouldn't shout at me if I were you, Naruto said in his cold voice, but his voice had an added edge to it, causing Kiba to pale even more, and begin to leak liquid down his pants. My friends are very protective of me, and if anyone tries to do more than speak or be friendly to me, they will personally take it as a threat and attack. The Inazuka who then tried to save what remained of his reputation, as the two were beginning to draw in a crowd of students gave Naruto a glare, and a humph. But it was a rather weak glare that looked rather comical, and when Kiba tried to grunt at him it came out more like a whine, which made the students begin to laugh, as the Inazuka stormed off, at a moderately quick walk, while deluding himself to believe that he was the true alpha, and not because he made himself look like a fool in front of his fellow students, while pissing his pants. Something that his mother and sister teased him about when he arrived home later, which made his anger for the silverette pretty boy grow to new heights. Naruto then sighed, something he had found himself doing a lot lately, and found himself randomly remembering what he knew of the rivalry between dogs and wolves. Which was that wild dogs were loyal to their masters and would die to protect them, wolves had no masters, and were loyal only to the pack, and looked after one another like a true family should. In his own view, Naruto believed that dogs and wolves were like samurai and mercenaries in a way, the dogs were the samurai who served a lord until their last breath, while most wolves with the exception for outcasts, were like mercenaries, the reasonable ones anyway, who fought had to earn a living to feed their family. How dare that much shout at you? Rhea spoke mentally as she watched as the Inazuka began to run back to where he lived. If I ever hear him shout in that tone of voice to you ever again. I'll hunt him down and... Rhea just drop it. Naruto replied to her. We're not here to indulge the children by picking fights with them. Which was somewhat ironic since Naruto was the same age as Kiba, but at the same time he was older mentally so he didn't consider himself as a child, and was above stooping to their level. However if Kiba and people like him were to suddenly get let's say pranked and no one found out who the culprit behind the pranks was. Well that was another story altogether, and hypothetically speaking he also might have developed a few genjutsu which he developed when he was bored, that he could use which were a barrel of laughs to anyone but the victim and he believed that Kiba was a fine first let's say test run to use them in certain combat situations that he promised to hypothetically speaking prank him the next day in class. After all this was just speculation of course, it's not like he had tagged the clueless Inazuka with a timed fart seal that might or might not go off tomorrow at lunchtime when the Inazuka was in front of a lot of students, which would signal Naruto to start the genjutsus to pay back Kiba for what he just did by yelling at him, and disturbing his inner peace. But then again this was just speculation, so who knows. Rias then sighed and gave Naruto a look, even though you hardly show it, you're too nice for your own good. You know that, right? She said, and Naruto smirked. Would you girls prefer if I was a complete and total sadistic ass of a dictator who wanted nothing more than the destruction of the entire elemental nations as well as Natsumi and Kashina? Rather than what I became today, and am now standing before you. He said, and Rias, Thea, as well as the other being inside of him whose name was Midna, round of applause for Naruto Kashina, all thought of that and all three of them became unnerved at the image of an insane, sadistic Naruto causing death and destruction everywhere. Not really Naruto-kun, husband, they each said in a deadpan tone, causing Naruto to chuckle slowly. However Akino on the other hand was softly giggling in a perverted manner as she imagined her ultimate fantasy where a sadistic Naruto kills an opponent in inhumane ways, then to her surprise grabbing her in her future human form, where then he would rip her clothes off of her defenseless self, and ravage her body for hours on end, and while doing so, he would use all manner of different tools to do so, which might and might not include whips and chains. Besides girls, I might or might not use those genjutsus tomorrow as payback for what he did and might use him as a test run. He said in all four, which included Akino, 
had paled as what he had just said had ripped Akino out of her UAL fantasies involving him, for a few seconds before they started to giggle and then burst out laughing, as they imagined what the Inazuka might have in store for him, though Rias and Akino had to struggle to keep their composure so as to keep the illusion that they were just regular animals. Tap, 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 oh Oni-chan. Naruto blinked as he looked and saw Natsumi approaching him, with a nervous look on her face, as if she was expecting to get hit if she said even the smallest of wrong words to irritate him. But, although she unintentionally was the cause of him getting tortured so much in his childhood, he wasn't the type of guy who was a complete douchebag and would hit a blind person out of combat, least of all his sister. What do you want, Natsumi? He asked and his younger twin fiddled with her hands while holding onto her Zatoichi with them, before she managed to speak. W.W. Would you? Would you like to? Um, walk home with me? She asked, while she, looked, at the ground and found it interesting. Naruto gazed at her for what seemed like an eternity before sighing as he shook his head. Quote dot dot dot, do what you wish. Her head then perked up at that. But, he trailed off while watching how she a supposedly blind person that he had noticed her condition when he had walked by her in the classroom acted as if she was seeing him, and came up with a theory on the spot, and raised his hand, which she reacted to, proving his theory correct, that she had discovered an alternative way to use a form of sight, no matter how primitive it was to him, without the use of her eyes. Naruto then continued what he was going to say, don't cling on to me like some sort of parasite, or else my friends will mistake you as a threat. Natsumi deflated at the parasite comment, but she nodded anyway as she moved to walk beside her brother, the two, dogs, watching her with wary but calm gazes, silently judged that she wasn't a threat. Natsumi was tempted to pet the closest one to her, which was Rias, but the look it had gotten in its eyes prevented her from doing so. The two Uzumaki children then left the academy grounds, heading in the direction of the Uzumaki Namikaze clan home. Half an hour later, it had been 30 minutes since they left the academy, and Naruto had noticed how some of the people in the crowd of those who were glaring hatefully now acted towards him as they gave apologetic bows, greeted him as if they hadn't done anything wrong, or looked away from him in shame. And lastly there were the ones who stared at him, not with hate, but in jealousy because of how nearly every single civilian woman to Kunoichi was looking at him with lustful stares like he was a prime piece of meat. And were massively blushing, while some had hearts in their eyes, and others had blood leaking from their noses, which reminded him of how the female battle wolves had began to react around him recently, as well as the males who were mated to some of the females as those males were more friendly around him for some reason saying that he was the cause of them having a fun time with their mates or something like that including the fact that when they looked at Natsumi, their eyes filled with barely concealed anger and hatred. Natsumi noticed it as well, but didn't comment seeing as how she got used to it. And remembered, that this change in personality that the residents of the hidden village of Kanahagakur, that she started to dislike greatly, did. Had started after Naruto had left the village, and that the cause of their change was when the known truth of what actually happened on October the 10th. 12 years previously which to Natsumi, that ever since she could remember, was a joyous celebration of her father's triumph over the Kyubi and was also her birthday, had turned into a horror-filled walking nightmare that was in her own definition hell on earth, where the civilians and shinobi had removed their emotional masks of being a peaceful, happy people who looked after one another, to show their real faces, that she was sure she had experienced only small part of what Naruto had to endure for so many years, alone was revealed to the village a week after the civilian council was suspended indefinitely from council meetings, and banned permanently from shinobi affairs while Kashina was put under house arrest. Which was about how the Sandame confessed to everyone in the village about how he and Kashina had lied to them about the Kyubi being sealed into her brother, and was instead truthfully sealed into her. And when the truth was revealed, only a small amount of the shinobi who hated Naruto, and some of the civilians that equaled a mere 35% became depressed after that, and of them a very small portion around 2% of them even committed suicide by seppuku. Of course, there was still a huge amount of shinobi, and civilians about 65% of the village who still saw Naruto as the fox wanted him dead at the time, which to this day they still do, but back then when they had been told the truth, the people in their anger chose her as their new scapegoat for their pain. 
And at first, it was only glares and them whispering behind her back whenever she left the compound, but then all the kids she used to hang out with, including her friends left her, believing their parents lies about how she was the Kyubi incarnate and at the same time she also experienced the first of many times where she was forcefully kicked out of a store. Then after that, three years ago at exactly the same day and month, where she had lost the use of her eyes a year later. A mob attacked her for the first time and while she was strong enough to handle the chunin in them. The Jonin were another matter entirely also along with various rumors that sprung up about her from some sources Eno, her mother the Yamanaka clan women, and a certain pink-haired howler that was the head of the now less powerful civilian council, and some bribes that exchanged hands most of the 33% of the population that didn't hate her brother and didn't mind her, had began to hate her. It wasn't until about four months ago or so that the mob attacks had stopped altogether for some reason, and everyone just settled for glaring hatefully at her, but even so, she avoided everyone and mainly stayed in the compound, but thankfully, not many people were out, however she still didn't let her guard down. It took 15 more minutes, until they had arrived at the front gate of the house and after passing through it, which made Naruto inwardly thankful that even though genetically he was mostly no longer a namikaze in the traditional sense, the blood seals on the gate still let him through, which made him believe that the gate opened because of his Uzumaki blood. Then, the two twins, and the wolves, which were familiars of the older looking twin arrived at the front door. Naruto then took a deep breath, which he let out in a sigh, knowing that there was bound to be some sort of commotion when he walked inside, and it all depended on his mother would react when she saw him. Might as well get this over with sooner, rather than later, he thought as he stepped up to the door, and turned the knob. In the house itself, Kashina and Makoto were still talking, and Kashina was telling the Uchiha matriarch about how she could have done a lot different and better with Naruto, with the Uchiha trying to assure her, that although what she did was horrible by most people's standards, she still regretted deeply, doing what she had done to him. Still, Kashina felt deep down that instead of being a favorist, which she had come to the realization some time ago that she was, she should have done something, anything more for him, and had no one to blame but herself. The two heard the door open and Kashina realized how late it was since Makoto had come by and had began to speak with her, and thought that Natsumi must have gotten back from the academy which made her remember when her daughter became blind. That had been a stressful period for the both of them. And Kashina didn't know what she would have done if it wasn't for Yugao taking Natsumi under her wing as a temporary apprentice. And teaching her how to use a cane sword for a reactive defensive kenjutsu style, that also incorporated the use of some offensive techniques to balance it out, and had also helped Natsumi get over her handicap and used to her new condition, by teaching Natsumi how to use her hearing and touch to get around and react to objects near her, as well as to help Natsumi get over her depression that she developed because she would never be able to see her brother, mother or anything again. Though it was a happy day for Kashina when her daughter had figured out how to use her evolved chakra sensing ability, as a form of sight to see which her daughter was extremely happy about since she could continue with her taijutsu training to use her personally created taijutsu style, that was still missing a few techniques to make it complete. Also when Kashina's house arrest had been lifted early. Due to good behavior, the first thing she did was to secretly track down the ringleaders of the mob that took her daughter's sight away. And brutally murdered them as a message, which somewhat worked. But to make sure that the people of Konoha would completely stop, she with the help of Makoto, and Yugao went after the ringleaders of every mob attack that happened to Natsumi, and like the first time, Kashina along with the duo made sure to leave the bodies of their victims intact with as much damage as possible without them being connected to the crime scene, to leave a message, which bore fruit four months ago, which the message was for everyone to leave Natsumi alone. She was about to say a greeting to her daughter, but stopped when she saw that Natsumi had entered the living room with a look that told her, that Natsumi was being apprehensive about something. Makoto noticed it as well as she blinked in confusion. Ka-san. Makoto Oba, the young blonde had began to say nervously, now making the two women more confused. Natsumi, what's the, Matt, she stopped and her eyes widened as she spotted someone come out from behind the wall in the direction that led to the front door to stand beside Natsumi. A person who she had never seen in a long time, and was just talking to her best friend, and part-time pillow friend Makoto about, now grown up, and dressed like a true shinobi. 
the same silver spiky hair that was on the tame side, that had white highlights, and red tips, royal purple eyes, three vertical scars underneath the left eye that extended to the left ear, and though they were fainter than she had last seen them, six thin whisker-shaped silver birthmarks, with three on each side of his face. She then noticed the differences, he now had auburn highlights here and there in his now shoulder-length hair, an eye patch over his right eye which to her could only mean he had lost it, which made tears begin to well up in her eyes, but she forcefully put them away so that she could see the rest of him, and saw that his left eye now had two teal rings in it, also that the pupil was slitted. His cheekbones were slightly raised higher than when she had last seen him, which made him even more beautiful in her own opinion, she then smelled some type of musk emitting from him, that was really pleasant to her, enough so that her cheeks began to gain a healthy red hue to them, and lastly she noticed that he was taller than Natsumi by a good four inches, making him look like he was in his mid-teens. Makoto was also in the same boat as Kashina, when she saw her best friend's lost son, now standing right there in front of her, standing right beside his sister. Only, when she had smelt the musk emitting from him, in addition to blushing, Makoto began to feel a sensation she hadn't felt since the last time she and Kashina released their pent-up UAL frustrations with each other a few years ago, as her nether regions began to get warm, making her blush get even redder from embarrassment, that just by looking at and smelling the musk emitting from her best friend's son, he could without doing anything, begin to turn her on. And to distract herself from doing a hasty decision like for example jumping the silver at then and there, she took notice of the two, large, wolves standing at his side. Admittedly she was a little nervous at the sight of the two apex predators, but right now, her main concern was for Kashina, whose tears had returned, and were about to spill from her eyes. I'd like to thank BC's Claymore for allowing me to use parts from their fanfic titled Namagakur which the parts are in chapter 6 somewhere. N. Naruto. Kashina asked, her voice barely above a whisper as she slowly began to approach her son. I. I is it really you? Naruto didn't say anything, but as he looked at the woman who bore him into the world, he saw that the Sandame was right. Him leaving really did leave some kind of impact on her, as he couldn't help but notice that she was now six feet zero, even, her crimson hair had gained some white highlights and white tips and had also grown to her calves from its previous length which was a little below her waist. Her hips were wider, and overall she was now more muscular, but still kept her womanly form. Also her S grew from the FF cup size he had last seen her with, to a huge pair of solid mid-J cups that defied gravity, and that her skin was paler, but still kept a slight tan to it, and he also saw faint shadows under her eyes that were now more of a dark magenta than purple with slightly slitted pupils which showed that she hadn't slept much for a long time, she also looked a little thinner, than when he had last seen her. S. Sochi. He heard her sob, and when she was close enough, her tears began to fall freely, she then rose both hands shakily to her son's face and placed them on each cheek. M my baby, she uttered out as she began caressing each cheek with her thumbs before rubbing the skin of his face down to his neck. Her tears then began to stream down her face as she continued her probing. Naruto didn't do anything to stop her as he watched as she eventually moved her hands down his body to gently caress his chest and waist though his clothes, which felt surprisingly good. And although he was indifferent to her, and his trust with her was mostly gone, he could at the very least allow her to do what she was currently doing. And like he said during his introduction at the classroom, if she proved herself enough to regain his trust and earn some of his respect, that he used to place in her as his mother, and even though he said he didn't hate her for doing what she had done to hurt him when he was younger he didn't forgive her for what she did then he would forgive her for what she had done. She then stopped a few minutes later, satisfied that he really was standing before her, then in a voice that broke as she looked into his face, said, Kami, it is you. And immediately threw herself into him and started sobbing and wailing loudly into his chest, soaking his vest and shirt while she threw her arms around him, and clung to him as though he was her very lifeline. She tried speaking, but her words were unintelligible. She allowed her legs to collapse, dropping to her knees and sliding down his body. She was now crying into his stomach, while still uttering words that were incomprehensible through her tears. And when Kashina threw herself into him, Rias and Akino looked as if they would attack her, but Naruto told them telepathically to not do anything, as he let his mother hold on to him. Though he was slightly bewildered, by what she was doing, it was then that he noticed Makoto who was both smiling and crying at the same time. 
She simply nodded at him, and looked at Natsumi who did the same thing and got the gist of what they were telling him to do. So reluctantly, and to make sure he wasn't a complete jerk he knelt down to one knee while maintaining Kashina's grip on him, and wrapped his own arms around her. Kashina feeling this, clung to Naruto even more tightly and began to cry louder. And after a few minutes, she pulled her face out of his chest and rested her chin on his shoulder, and brought one of her arms behind his neck and held him to her by the back of his head. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, she kept repeating to him over and over as she got quieter, her energy leaving her upon having cried so much, and so hard. So after letting Kashina hold onto him for some time, he moved to let go of her, but stopped when she cried out, no, and clung to him even more tightly. When he looked at her with confusion and slight apprehension, she then explained her action, please, baby, just hold me for a few more minutes. I don't want you to let me go yet, and I don't want to let you go, either. He didn't fully understand her request, but nonetheless acquiesced with a slight nod. Kashina then leaned into him even more as he gently tightened his hold on her. He felt her hands then begin to roam his back and come around his chest, just rubbing both clothing and skin. And in a corner of his mind, he couldn't help but notice how the feel of her huge ass were pressed up against his chest, and wondered why she wasn't wearing a bra, since he could also feel her hardened ass pushing against him as well, which was something that he had never paid any attention to whenever he had received a rare hug from her before he left. He then inwardly cursed his wolf-like instincts for being in the presence of a prospective alpha mate as his body started to react, especially a certain part of his anatomy on the lower half of his body, when she started to get more affectionate with him. She ed his face several times, and he twice caught her licking her lips after ing him. She also buried her face into his chest or into his hair several times, inhaling deeply as if to take in his body's smell, which she actually was doing since she couldn't get enough of that pleasant musk emitting from him. It also didn't help that she was wearing a knitted short-sleeved indigo sweater dress with a V-cut that had a black belt with a buckle on and reached mid-thigh as well as beige stockings, which revealed all of her curves as well as her toned legs and arms, as well as showing a large amount of her cleavage with some sweat running down it since it had been a particularly hot day out. He had also seen the tattoos on her right arm and left leg. What in the world is she doing? Naruto wondered confused by her actions, though he made no move to stop her. Eventually she pulled back a few inches and brought both of her hands into his hair, gently strumming her fingers through it while also clenching her hands in it as well. She did this while putting his head down towards hers, and touched her forehead to his own. Makoto and Natsumi both noted the confusion on Naruto's face, as did Kashina. She was still shedding tears, though she wasn't crying vocally at this point anymore. Seeing his confusion, Kashina explained her actions to him once again, I'm sorry, this must be rather strange to you. And Naruto nodded in agreement seeing as he had never seen this kind of behavior from her, when he was growing up before he had run away, which kind of reminded him of Ginesu Gigi's Guinness search but much weaker and different but before he could think further on it, she continued, this just helps me get to know you, that's all. Hun, Naruto asked, being no less confused than he was before. What she means, Naruto-kun. Makoto, who had used the kun suffix subconsciously, elaborated with a smile and drawing his attention towards her again. Is that she is very sensuous. This is one of the ways in which she can familiarize herself with you. She learns through her senses, much like the same way that you do through your body. What you feel like, your scent, even how you taste, if she can get away from it, these are things that stand out to her about people. This is her first step in really trying to get to know you. Naruto looked back at Kashina who confirmed Makoto's explanation with a nod. She then brought her hands from his hair to his face and started caressing his cheeks once more, this time using the whole of each hand instead of just her thumbs. The expression on her face was still one of desperation, though it was milder now. Naruto then gave a very faint, soft smile, and closed his eye as he let her go while standing up. With Kashina responding in kind and stood up, but had not yet relinquished her hold on him. He then sighed as he opened his eye, and for the first time, since he arrived in Konoha, I know you don't want to hear this from me, but at this point in time, I can't trust you, or Natsumi. He spoke in a slightly warmer tone of voice, than his usual cold one, 
while Kashina just shook her head as she still held on to him. It doesn't matter, she said, you're back home, and that's all that matters to me. Naruto blinked at that, he had expected some type of confrontation from her, but she surprised him by doing the complete opposite of his expectations, so lost was he in his thoughts over it, he continued to let Kashina hold on to him. And after a few minutes, he came to the conclusion that many expectations he had regarding her would be broken over the coming years, simply by living in the same house as her. Which made him inwardly sigh, since it looked like Rias, and Akino and him would be staying in the Uzumaki Namikaze clan house for the foreseeable future. And unknown to Naruto, Thea and the second being inside of him known as Midna, were watching the whole thing, and couldn't but smile to each other, as they felt the love Kashina had for her son through him. They knew it would take a while, but from what they saw of the Kyuubi's memories, Kashina was a very determined woman, and would do anything in order to win her son's trust back. However, what concerned them was that they felt, and smelt something different from Kashina when she had threw herself at him. And what they noticed, was that Kashina was no longer fully human, but something else, that the closest thing that they could compare it to at the moment was a Han Yu of sorts where Kashina was currently two-thirds human, five-sixths of something that smelt like the Kyuubi, and one-sixth of something that smelt similar to a demon but much stronger. They didn't want to trouble Naruto with this information at the moment, so they both decided to just watch as a mother was reunited with her son once again. Unknown location that night, after five years of slumber, IT had woken up, and IT finally knew how it came into being, as well as what it had been disgusted by, and IT also figured out where it was. And to start off, IT Hall learned that it was the manifestation of Sakura Haruno's inner potential, and that she had manifested when she was discarded by Sakura, when she had started to become a fangirl in favor of being a serious kunoichi. Second, was that the manifestation of Sakura's inner potential now knew that it was disgusted with how the person that she manifested from turned out, in fact she was so disgusted with Sakura's existence that she had chosen to give herself a new name, Ringo. And lastly she learned that she was in the deepest part of Sakura's subconscious mind, where everything related to Sakura's common sense was thrown into. It was also in this place that Ringo, also found out that she had not just been created solely from Sakura. But she had also partly manifested, because of the chakra of a silver-haired boy, who had helped Sakura and gave her just a tiny bit of his chakra, when she was just a little girl, and was bullied by several kids, in which he had saved her, and upon seeing a cut on Sakura, he not knowing what else to do since the villagers hated him, had given Sakura a tiny portion of his chakra, which had the side effect of not only healing Sakura, which the silver-haired boy intended, but also allowing Ringo to be created, manifest and awaken some years after that event had happened. It also caused Ringo to gain a slight interest in the boy, which turned into infatuation when Sakura's most recent memories of the boy whom had grown into a gorgeous stud in her own opinion, that Ringo found out was named Naruto, had introduced himself to the class. Ringo, then thought to herself, that if she could somehow get Naruto's attention, then maybe he might somehow be able to help her get out of Sakura. She then began to think of what he might accept for helping her to get out of this disgusting place which was Sakura's head. The end. Now we will see you in the next video.